I'll start with reading the script. Um, Ms. Marling, you're turning on the recording. Yes, we're up, we're recording, very good. As chair of the House eDNA Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing on bills referred to the committee and scheduled in the House calendar for today. An executive session may be held on any bill referred to the committee. Please note there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and, if necessary, participate in the meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the General Court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House Rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. All votes that are taking this meeting shall be done by roll call. We'll start by taking a roll call attendance and when each member states they're present, please also state if there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. And in order to, to vote, if we are voting on any bill, any bill, it will needs to be by video so we can see your face. Thank you. Sitek, please call the roll. Representative Allegro, present. Oh, I'll have you sign this. Present. Alone at home. Uh -huh. Representative Fellows. Representative Fellows. Oops, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Let me join here. Fellows is here. Um, home alone. Representative Fontenot. I am here and I am home in Rochester. My wife is in the house. Representative Boley. Here at home and my wife is in the other room. Representative Rhoda. I am home in my office alone. Representative Judy. I am home. My wife, she's in your other home. Representative Murder is here. <laughs> Representative Legas is here. I'll have you sign. Representative McGuire is here. I'll have you sign. Representative O'Brien. I am present and I'm here in Nashua and home alone. Representative Pearson. Representative Pearson is in the room. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative uh, Roy, uh, Representative Roy here. I'm replacing Roy. Here. Oh, you're replacing Roy. I'm yes. sorry. Yes, Representative Roy is not here. Representative oh, bad. Okay, I have to. Uh, Representative Lanzara. I'm here at home. Uh, the family is around Zooming. I've been upgraded to the living room. <laughs> uh, Representative Santo Nastasso. I'm here uh, alone in Ringe. Representative Schmidt. Uh, 
Representative Schmidt, I see you. Unmute yourself, please. Are you good? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mute myself, so I didn't unmute myself. Let me see. I, I'm apparently unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Representative Schuett, yes. Yes, I'm present at my home alone. Representative Schultz. Present at my home in Concord and my husband, Gene Taylor, will be in and out of the room. And I'm here, the clerk is here, Representative Yakubovich. Present at home, alone in the room. That's really bad. Uh, Madam Chairman, we have a full house. Thank you. All right. On House, house Bill 85, relative to the Atlantic Standard Time, I call Representative Yopella, the prime sponsor. Thank you, Madam Chairman and uh, members of the committee. And uh, thank you for accepting my testimony in favor of my bill. Uh, moving us to the Atlantic time zone and off of uh, daylight savings time. This bill may look very familiar as it is the same bill that was um, passed from this committee a couple of years ago. And it is, it is uh, back again. So in, uh, in California and Florida, they have passed uh, measures around uh, daylight savings times in an attempt to go to daylight savings time all year round. However, that would require an act of Congress, which um, efforts are moving towards that, but it doesn't seem to be um, forthcoming. And so this proposal would make that same move without the need for an act of Congress. Um, in 2017, Massachusetts formed a special commission to study the costs and benefits of this change. Um, and they actually came up with the idea of moving to the, well, the, they kind of sanctioned the idea of moving um, as a group to the Atlantic time zone instead of um, waiting for, for Congress to uh, allow for uh, allowing for or waiting for the for Congress to allow that move. Um, they the commission found that there was an increase in economic growth and productivity while reducing on the job injuries, traffic fatalities, heart attacks, energy costs, greenhouse emissions. Um, a lot of these benefits come from just not switching uh, at twice a year. Um, however, since we are um, on a, based on our uh, longitude, uh, the, the Eastern time zone is a very wide time zone. It go, covers about um, one hour and a half to one hour and 45 minutes of of time uh, via the sun. And so it was uh, suggested that at least part of the Eastern part of the Eastern time zone move to uh, this, this Atlantic time zone while leaving the Western part of the, uh, the, uh, the Eastern time, current Eastern time zone in their uh, current time so that uh, it would more reflect what the sun is actually doing. Uh, the, another recommendation which which is uh, kind of goes in tandem with this but is not something that should be uh, addressed uh, via a statute is a recommendation for schools to not start before 8 30 a.m. This goes to the suggestion that um, children need that their their sleep, and also with this, when this um, this passes, you don't want to have uh, kids going to school in the dark. Um, so, it, with this result, um, well, currently, um, Eastern time zones states in the uh, very far east. Part of that time zone when they fall 
fall back in the winter, they have sunsets around 5 to 5.30 p.m. And this can uh, cause issues in the evening commute in the dark, which increases collisions with pedestrians and wildlife. And um, so this, this change would only affect those winter months. Uh, we would only be uh, at a different time zone than the, the rest of the Eastern time zone four months of the year, as long as they kept their uh, daylight savings time. And so one of the, the hurdles that have come up with this is um, pushback by uh, the Broadcasters Association um, because of the the complexities of trying to create more ad uh, options and selling ad space. And so the way that it was trying, that, that the uh, commission in Massachusetts tried to address this issue was to go as a block. And that's why this bill is um, contingent on kind of our, our region of Massachusetts and um, Maine, but if it, uh, if we came to an agreement with the, uh, the Broadcasters Association that more states would be needed to uh, be economically feasible for them, that would be considered absolutely. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to thank you for, for hearing my testimony. And there, there is an expert, hopefully, um, let me just make sure, yeah, um, an expert that is, uh, I welcome to uh, talk about it, this issue in more detail. His name is Scott Yates, if you would be able to. Um, he is on the list, Mr. Yeah, yeah, to, to talk to the more, more uh, intricate details of the studies and stuff like that, but I would be happy to um, entertain like more general questions if the committee has such. Thank you. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Representative McKellar. Um, just looking through the latter part of the bill, the 24-25 area line, you, you reference Maine and Massachusetts. It's my understanding that Rhode Island has also entered into a Me Too clause in the event that Boston chooses to go to the Atlantic time zone as well. Is, is, am I correct in that? So thank you for the question. Um, yes, so this kind of, um, a, a bunch of states have um, similar bills with similar contingencies. And so kind of like Maine uh, currently doesn't have a bill, but if Maine had one before, they were contingent on uh, New Hampshire and New Hampshire was contingent on Massachusetts and Rhode Island is contingent on Connecticut and Connecticut is contingent on Massachusetts and, and, uh, and uh, New York now. And so it kind of just creates a kind of rolling effect of we need a bigger and bigger block um, before it actually goes into effect. But once it happens, pretty much the whole region is going to go at the same time. And um, so for those reasons, that's why I would be more, I would be open to um, uh, larger blocks proposed potentially by a broadcasters association. So thank you for the question. Representative Blackus. Um, is Connecticut actually considering uh, changing? Because I wouldn't expect them um, to move from a different time zone to New York City, given the number of people in Connecticut that, uh, that work there. Thank you for the question. They actually have two bills uh, this time, uh, this session for that exact, uh, this exact language, and they are contingent on New York. Last time uh, they had a bill that wasn't contingent on New York and they added that contingency. So the bill currently in uh, Connecticut, well, both of the bills are contingent on New York. So if that bill passes, and New York is also considering the same, it, the same uh, 
bill and they're contingent on New Jersey. And so it's, it's a cascading effect. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I think we should uh, just keep it with Massachusetts and Maine and let New York deal with its own problems. All right. Uh, I, other questions? See. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Brian, yes, please, Representative. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative, for taking the question. Uh, we all kind of lived through the Y2K and nothing really happened. But I would like you to speak about the economic impact uh, with computers and everything else when you uh, purchase new electronic equipment. It, it has you designate which type of time zone that you're in. And uh, would that affect any type of... Uh, uh, problems with the electronic devices that could have an economical impact on the economy that you anticipate with this? Thank you for the question. Um, so as you alluded to, there is just a switch that, that um, computers have to designate which time zone that you're in and it automatically um, is going to go forward correct from that time on once you select that time zone and so it would be a one-time cost up front, I guess. And then, however, the, in the uh, special commission report, they found that it was the benefits were greatly outweighed the cost because it, uh, it, they found that people are much more likely to go shopping after work if it's still light. And so... Uh, there would just be an increased economic uh, incentive during the winter months in, in uh, New Hampshire and in this region. And so those would greatly outweigh the one-time costs of switching to a different time zone on your computer. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Representative. Representative Broda. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> if this bill was enacted in Massachusetts and Maine went along, what time would it be now? It would be uh, 9-18. Follow up? Follow up. Thank you. <clears throat> what other states have, it, that are outside of New England have this regulation? What, what, excuse me, what do you mean by regulation? Well, this, I'm sorry, are not, are not using this time zone now. Let's say it that are way. Are no other states on Atlantic time at the moment? It's, yes. uh, parts of Canada are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. Currently, um, the only place in new, in, uh, in uh, the United States, that that uh, does not exist. That would be on the same time zone currently is uh, Puerto Rico that I know of. But there may be there may be others other um, districts that that would be covered under this. But uh, there, as far as other states that are considering this option, there is a lot of them. And um, Scott. Yates may be able to uh, more fully uh, address how many people are considering this option versus considering the option of moving to daylight savings time all year round and waiting for Congress versus other, other options that are proposed to address the issue of the time switching. So thank, thank you. you for the question. Thank you. Senator Goley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Uh, the bill states that within 180 days of similar actions between Maine and Massachusetts, that the governor shall petition the United States Secretary of Transportation to move to the Atlantic time zone. Is he, uh, is the secretary obliged to go along with this or can he deny it? So it's a shall, so it would be required that he submit the application. Uh, the 
there would be hearings on the cost benefits and people would um, testify to um, the, the Secretary of Transportation. It wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be going to the Secretary of State in New Hampshire for another um, discussion on whether or not he should apply. If the legislature tells him to apply, then he would apply. Follow up? Follow up. But the US Secretary of Transportation could deny this petition, correct? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yes, it, it's potent, if it was unreasonable, um, you know, there's, there's um, things that they might consider. There's strong evidence that shows that, um, that there is good reason to. And so it's unlikely that they would, would deny it, but it's possible, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Representative Fellows. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, no problem. Thanks, I'm coming at it from two angles. Um, Representative Ocala, isn't it correct that the Department of Transportation has very specific standards about how they would um, decide on making a time zone change and doesn't it deal primarily with transportation? Thank you for the question. They would consider a wide range of things, but yes, uh, obviously it, it goes with their name that their main concern is transportation, absolutely. And follow up, please. Follow up. Uh, the other issue is, um, I, I read the report from the Maine Study Commission and that was in 2017 and they have um, yet to enact anything in Maine. I'm wondering if you can give us some history on this proposal to change time zones. My um, understanding it's been going on for a number of years in multiple states and the um, U.S. Department of Transport um, Commerce or whoever makes that decision has yet to approve any of those time zone changes. That's the end of my question, thanks. Thank you for the question. So there hasn't been any request to the um, uh, Secretary of Transportation to switch. So there would be no denying or accepting um, at, at this state. This idea of switching to Atlantic time zone is relatively new. The, the previous efforts were to just accept daylight savings time all year around and wait for the con for Congress to allow that. And so, but uh, I've only been, um, obviously I've only been in the legislature. This is my second term. And so um, Scott Yates would be able to, to uh, follow up more with the history and all the different states. Many states propose it. Um, you know, Maine right now is, is suggesting to create their own study and I talked with the representative there and they're talking about potentially just uh, putting in a bill to go with no contingencies, no, no other state contingencies, but we'll find out what their, their study finds if uh, they end up passing that legislation. So it's, there are many, there are many solutions being, being floated, but I don't, I don't uh, agree that, that the state, uh, of tr the uh, Secretary of Transportation has denied any requests for this this change because I don't believe it is um, has passed and been uh, requested of them to to change that. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Representative Yukela. I call Representative Horrigan. There I am. There I am. There I am. I'm muted, and you can even see me. It's a good thing I put on a, a tie for this. So my name is uh, Timothy Horrigan. I'm, I'm I represent Stratford County's District 6, which is the towns of Durham and Madbury. And I actually, back in 2011, I sponsored the bill that created the, that created the current statute about daylight savings time. And I was just uh, making the definition of state law the same as that in federal law, which, uh, which was something that could have caused some confusion, but it didn't, but it could have. So um, we mentioned uh, I mentioned from Durham, I was actually born in South Bend, Indiana, the hometown of the current uh, Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. 
fact, he lives in uh, the same neighborhood where I spent part of my childhood, except I'm slightly older, as you can tell by the color of my hair. And um, this reason the Department of Transportation is in charge of time zones is because this was originally became necessary when we built the railroad network. So it caused huge, um, before that, people, cities were just operating on, um, on you know, solar time by where the sun is. But um, once we had railroads going, we needed to get everybody in sync. And so that's why they have the time zones. They're not perfectly aligned with longitude. It is true that we're here in New Hampshire, we're about due north of Puerto Rico, which is on the Atlantic Standard Time. And uh, that would probably cause some confusion. So one of the political issues, probably we should wait on this before we make this change to see if Puerto Rico becomes a state, which seems to be more probable now than it has in the past. Although that like daylight savings time has been kicked around for years. So get back to South Bend, it has to be in the Northwestern corner of the uh, state near Chicago. And that part of Indiana is a long history of confusion of a controversy and confusion over daylight savings time. In fact, I have two birthdays because of that. Cause like uh, my mother, uh, South Bend, I think was operating on- um, Representative from Oregon. Yes. So anyway, get back to the point of the hand. Um, it's kind of an arbitrary, it's an arbitrary thing. I've gone, um, it's kind of an arbitrary thing, what we call these time zones where we draw the lines of the map. But I think it's the uh, simplest thing to do is keep with the current practice even though switching it's not an ideal thing switching time zones uh, twice a year and it does cause some problems but i think it would cause even more problems if we uh went on a time zone that normally which now is used only in puerto rico and the virgin island so i would say uh, i would say even though there's a lot of logicalities in the law it would create less confusion to keep things the way they are and uh, so that is to uh, also, a simpler way, if we do want to be in the same time zone year round with Maine, Massachusetts, uh, whatever, Rhode Island, whatever states want to be, it helps in terms of the label we put on it, it would probably just be easier to go to daylight savings time year round, just because um, there are some people who don't go to Canada or Puerto Rico very much, you don't really know what Atlantic Standard Time is. So Eastern Daylight Time is the same time zone as, uh, as uh, Atlantic Standard Time, so that would be simple solution, even though it does require an act of Congress, that would probably be simpler than, you know, what we have, you know, trying to Representative another time. So, questions? Um, yeah. So thank you. Representative Judy, you have a question? Yes, Madam Chair. You have a question? Looks like he's muted. Yes, you're muted, Representative Judy. Okay. What about now? That's better. Thank you. Please ask your question. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, please, could you please rem uh, remind me? We have a uh, similar bill uh, a couple of years ago or, or two years ago. Uh, what is the difference between uh, those two, please? Almost none. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I answer, yeah, I just say this is a perennial issue. It's it's uh, it was not new um, when I worked on it way back ten years ago, um, and uh, it, it's been kicking around for a while. And maybe someday we'll pass a bill. Maybe not. You know, as Reverend Yokola correctly pointed out, it depends on a lot of other what happens in other states and federally and so forth. So it's it's a perennial bill. So that's why so every Two years or so, um, it comes up again. So here it is. So, so, thank you, Representative Allegro. Yes, thank you for taking my question. I I thought I understand this, but something that was just said confused me a little bit, and I just want to make sure I'm 100 clear. Uh, the idea was that we're, uh, we're we might be switching to a system used only in Puerto Rico and Eastern Canada. My understanding is that if this is enacted, it will be only when a chunk of the uh, eastern yeah. uh, uh, seaboard. Um, yes. Operating. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Currently, currently the Atlantic time zone is a uh, time zone used in eastern Canada, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, and then obviously point south. So um, yeah, yeah it, it is required. It's a 
will require like action from other states and possibly even the Canadian provinces and so forth. So, all right, thank you, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am very excited to speak about this bill as a co-sponsor. That is, it is a nonpartisan topic that I care about deeply. And for those of you on the committee may remember, I care about it so much two years ago that I decided to, to as, and I wasn't a co-sponsor, that I uh, signed in to speak after hearing all of your questions. And here's why. There's a handful of reasons why. Uh, first of all, uh, the amount of car accidents and work incidents, accidents that happen because of daylight savings in the time switch is statistically significant. The number of heart attacks goes up 24% on the Monday after the time change. And there is even a, an uh, increase in the number of strokes and a temporary increase in the number of suicides because as sleep re researchers have determined, even an hour change um, in your sleep disturbance, uh, quoting Matthew Walker, a sleep researcher, that's how fragile and susceptible your body is to even just one hour of lost sleep. And I know this personally because I actually am someone who is very sensitive to uh, issues around sleep. I have an autoimmune disorder that one of the symptoms is an issue with sleep. And, uh, consistency of sleep is very yep. important to maintaining my personal health. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, I heard an interruption. I apologize. Um, I'll continue. I also um, suffer from seasonal depression and I'm very happy to show you my light box since I'm next to it. Um, and I know that many people in your districts, if you ask them about this, very much would like to get rid of the time change issue. It is very disruptive. Um, another issue that I remember being raised uh, that compelled me to testify last time and I'm excited to co-sponsor is because of the confusion that people assume will happen if this passes and the group of states, a block of states decide to uh, ditch the time change. And I wanted to reassure you, and I think this is something that Representative Corrigan was trying to point out, that I grew up on the westernmost boundary of the eastern time zone in Louisville, Kentucky, and just 45 minutes south of us was the time change. And a whole section of uh, the viewing audience for the Louisville media market actually included this time change. So every th everything on television was announced uh, Eastern and Central time. Both times were listed in everything. Um, and it really wasn't a big deal, maybe because I was raised with it, but many people live near a time zone uh, change. And quite a few states actually have two different time zones in their own state, like Kentucky does, Tennessee does, and many others. And it really is not a big deal to have a time zone change near you. It is just a matter, in fact, of a way of life. Uh, you just know when you're driving south towards Fort Knox that the time is going to change. And it is just a matter of fact of living, just like it is when you know that the time is going to change here, but with none of the uh, car accidents and heart attacks that happen because of the two times of changes in, um, in those issues. I also want to point out that there's a lot of myths around why we even have daylight savings uh, changes. I will send a video out again that I sent, I think two years ago, um, that sort of humorously portrays the myths of why we do it. Um, it has only been about a hundred years that we've been doing it. And it was inspired by a change that Germany made, I think in 1918, but um, really, uh, having the two times a year of time change is very disruptive and most people hate it. And uh, I think it's only 
an excess of questions and an, Ill, an, an Ill, inability to accept change is the only reason why we haven't ditched it already when it is so universally despised. So I hope that we will gain nonpartisan, bipartisan support, however you want to look at that. that and if you are um, concerned about this issue, I just encourage you to talk to your constituents. And I especially hope my fellow Democrats will ask me any questions and concerns that you may have. I know we've continued to talk about this bill for the two years since we last heard it. So bring them on. Thank you, Representative Schiltz. I would also like to point out that it's not just humans that have a problem with this. Um, the body clock of my pugs, when it's time to eat, you could almost set your watch to. Is yes. any questions for Representative Schiltz on her testimony? Representative Schuett. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Representative Schultz. Good morning, um, Representative Schuett. I am listening to your testimony, and it seems that the basic thrust of all of the problems that you mention, uh, health issues, accidents, and so forth, are a result of changing times, uh, not a specific time in a big zone. And would that not be true? It is the, dif the difficulty comes in the springing forward and the falling back two times a year. I hope I wasn't confusing and comparing the two different, there's two sets of concerns that I remember hearing before. So I just wanna make sure I'm clear about them. To live in a specific time zone and have the spring forward and fall back that the time changes require creates a physical difficulty. That's one specific concern. And that is what causes the a temporary raise in the number of heart attacks, suicides, work accidents, and car accidents. The other concern I was maybe, I, I hope I was clear, is that you know, there were concerns around where the boundaries of a time zone change might be and the concerns about New Hampshire potentially having one on our Western border. And the concerns that I was addressing in that regard was just the matter of factness. It, it was uh, to live near a time zone change. So there's significant differences uh, and difficulties raised by experiencing the time zone you live in changing two times a year and the desire to ditch that is huge and living near a time zone boundary is really not a big deal. Those are two very distinct issues. So to switch to what is Atlantic time to then adopt what we have eight months of the year with daylight savings so it'd be adopting what we have during daylight savings and ditching where we are now to get rid of that time change two times a year. Uh, the phys that would be a physical relief for many people and um, that is the difficulty. The difficulty living near a time zone boundary is no big deal. Does that help? I think so. Um, uh, that was going to lead to a follow-up question. Okay, sure. Um, well, I'm, is that all right, Mr. Chair? All right with me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that would be that from what we have heard, uh, Vermont is not, how shall I say, on board with this program. Is that not true? I believe that is how the bill is written. And, I, and I, that the questions about Vermont is why I felt it important to explain what it was like growing up near a time boundary, uh, you know, a time zone boundary. Um, this would move us to the a westernmost point of the Atlantic time change. And having grown up at the westernmost point of the um, eastern time zone to central time zone was really no big deal. The difficulty and the desire to create this change is in the actual switching of our existing time from daylight savings to daylight standard and then daylight standard to daylight savings. Um, everyone would just know if this passes and the other states adopt it 
and a block of states then adopt Atlantic time. You would just know Vermont is in Eastern time. And um, there would be signs at the border if you didn't know, but everyone would just know, oh, it's actually seven o'clock, not eight o'clock in Vermont. And it's no big deal. Follow up. Follow up. Thank you. Um, okay, you just brought up another issue to my mind. You mentioned signs at the border. Uh, so there's gonna be a cost with putting up signs that tell people the time difference. Is that not true? I believe that would be very minimal. The actual savings you would gain from uh, not having this big blip in heart attacks with your health uh, healthcare costs, Medicare, Medicaid costs, and the amount of uh, costs it would uh, incur from your car insurance uh, actually would surely offset that in a societal sense. I can't imagine a few signs along our border is that expensive. But Thank sure, you. It would have a cost. Thank you. Representative Goley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Schultz for taking my question. Uh, we hear an increase of heart attacks and other health issues from changing time twice a year. How come we don't hear that same argument when folks travel from one time zone to another and back and forth within a week of each other, um, springing forward, springing back? Um, is that being an issue? How come we don't require people, uh, we don't hear about the health hazards of changing time zones when we travel? That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to it. Maybe the folks that are uh, re research experts after me can answer that question. I guess it's just a comparison of, you know, not many of us, uh, you know, when we travel, it's not the same comparison or easy comparison as it is to an entire state or town or half of a state changing at the same time. You know, we're talking about a level of consistency and comparison to the rest of the year on two Mondays, essentially, of a year that an, an everybody is changing. Um, but I'll maybe folks that are better experts at this after me can answer that question. But it's a good question. Thank you. Representative Vernon Blackus, you have a question? Uh, yes, just brief. Um, there's been discussions of, uh, of the alternative instead of going to Atlantic Standard Time of going to daylight savings time permanently. But isn't um, those functionally the same as far as uh, what the time would be? And the only difference is that and perhaps Atlantic Standard Time would be more straightforward and uh, permanent daylight savings time would require an act of Congress. That makes sense. I don't, I don't know if that was a question, but... Um... Is that true? Doing both puts it sounds like it's true. You know, maybe people don't want to have their time zone named Atlantic time zone, but I believe that's true. Or maybe the sponsor, the lead sponsor would be better to answer that question, but it is, it is functionally the same as just remaining in the daylight savings time that we will be switching to in March. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Representative Pearson points out that the Red Sox would not be affected by the schedule change, but the Patriots would be. Right. Simple way of putting that for folks. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, we have two, two minutes left in the time allotted for this for this bill, and three people who need to speak. So, yes, thank you plus two other people that have volunteered and Representative Fellows has a question. So I believe that it would be appropriate to recess this hearing until 10 o'clock on the 18th. We're not going to finish it anytime soon. I apologize to the members of the public who have come to join us, but uh, we don't have, have the time to continue.
Okay, so we're going to move on to House Bill. We're going to open a public hearing on House Bill 499, and the chair is going to recognize to speak on her bill. Yes, thank you. House Bill 499. Please mute yourself. A House Bill 499 prohibits the state from using a face recognition. It consists of two parts. The first part is a restriction of how face recognition technology can be used in court. And this part was developed by Representative Birch as a result of some difficulties we had with a previous bill on the same topic last session. And it has some very, very clear uh, restrictions. There is a later amendment by another member of the general court who is also a lawyer, who has an amendment that, that restricts face recognition more broadly. Uh, I'm happy to support either of them, but I am not a lawyer. I am unfamiliar with court practice, and I don't really have a way to determine the implications of either of those positions. The part that I concentrated on was part two, which is which prohibits the state from engaging in face recognition. The we do currently have a database of faces in our driver's license database. And this would prohibit the Department of Transportation from using face recognition on that or allowing it to be used by anybody for under the process of face recognition. It also bans other, other state agencies to create or maintain a searchable database of faces. When I researched this over the summer, all of the photo databases were in Health and Human Services, and they were all, they, none of them were searchable by face recognition. You could go into them by name and say, this person, here's a picture of this person who is an employee of the department, if you want to verify his presence. This is a person, this is a photo of the person, of the name you named, who is a licensed plumber. And here's a photo that he can use to verify this is actually uh, that person. You can, they're all go in by name and find the photo, which you know, sometimes you need to know who's who. What you can't do is take a picture of somebody and scan that database and say, oh, this person who's whose face came up on a convenience store robbery photo is actually a plump name so and such and such. So you can go in with the name and get the photo, that's fine. You cannot go in with a photo of an unidentified person and use the state's resources to, to obtain identifying data. That's the part that I, that I wrote and I'm, uh, at this point, None of them are used that way, and I would very much like to establish the prohibition before they get into it. And I will answer any questions on part two and defer part one to the other, to the experts. Um, Madam, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair, I do have a question, if I may. Yes, Representative O'Brien. Thank you. And thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, currently now on your cell phone, the technology does exist. Uh, police departments do use it. If I had my cell phone with me and I went and created a robbery, uh, they could track that my whereabouts via that device. Also, <clears throat> people do know how I travel with the... Uh, uh, with the transponder that is on my uh, vehicle. Uh, so how is this face recognition with the new technologies really different in, in the, the trackability that we're living in in today's modern world? The main thing is, is you've, your, your phone 
says the phone is in this location. All right, your phone could be stolen and someone else could use it. And there are no prohibitions in this bill on any private use of face recognition or any local use of, of face recognition. There is only a restriction on what the state government does and on what can be used in court. So if your employer, uh, assuming it's not a government agency, say Fidelity wants to set up face recognition system for people who are walking into their offices in Merrimack, that's their business. They can do that. Thank you. Representative Grota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative McGuire, when we heard this bill, I think it was a year and a half ago, there was um, some there were some comments from the New Hampshire State Police. And if I remember correctly, an amendment was written to address those concerns. Are the components of that amendment still in this bill? Uh, yes, the both both the bill as written and the amendment to be offered later are address police use of facial recognition. And okay, thank I don't you. know the details. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll point out that uh, page page one, looking at the bottom in lines twenty one through Sorry. it appears to be the end, do cover exemptions Sorry. for law enforcement. It's like a court order. Do we have any other questions? It's time. The chair does not see any other hands raised on this matter. Do I have any in the row? I do not. All right, we're going to close the public hearing. No. Oh, stand by. Um, there are yeah. other people who have. I'm signed up to speak. Oh, my, oh, there we go. Okay. I did not have hands raised in the attendance list. They are the Representative Birch and Representative Smith are have both signed up to speak and three other individuals. All right. Representative Birch, if you can raise your hand so I can find you in the attendance list. <laughs> Representative Smith. Uh, Good morning. Um, my name is Marjorie Smith. I represent Durham and Madbury, um, which is uh, Stratford 8 District. When this committee last saw this bill, you considered it to be of such significant importance that you uh, created a subcommittee that did an incredible amount of work to address the concerns that had been raised and to come up with a bill that you believed um, addressed those concerns. EDNA passed the bill, it went to the floor, the floor passed the bill and sent it to the Judiciary Committee. At that point, at that time, I chaired the Judiciary Committee and I will confess to you 
that I consider my most significant failure as chair of the Judiciary Committee was to find a way to have people understand the implications of facial recognition and the possible misuse, because in the end, the Judiciary Committee voted ITL on this bill. I'm back again because I believe it is an incredibly important bill. And as you might well be aware, since you first considered this bill, we have had situation after situation where we have been able to measure both the pluses of facial recognition, and there certainly are pluses, and the minuses of facial recognition, and there are significant minuses. And because of my commitment to the importance of personal privacy and of, um, I'm going to use two terms, both civil rights and civil liberties. Um, I am back today with an amendment that takes the bill that um, uh, Chairman McGuire introduced and attempted to incorporate in it a recognition of how if used correctly, facial recognition is a plus, but if not used correctly, it can create terrible, deleterious um, repercussions, particularly for people of color and for women. Two categories where, at least so far, the level of facial recognition technology has not been able to ensure accurate um, reporting. I have... Um, given to you amendment 0247H. It has uh, the chair's uh, name on it, Chair McGuire, and my name on it. And what this bill, this amendment tries to do is balance the pluses and minuses of facial recognition, having to do exclusively with the powers of the state and um, what it does is put in place a very commonly used and effective tool of a warrant to say that in order for the police to um, use facial recognition they need a warrant, and as you all well know, warrants can be um, granted very quickly. There is no um, reason to believe that there is, has to be a, a significant time delay, and, um, and it makes it possible to put a belt and suspenders on a system to make sure that we can get the benefits of facial recognition, but not encourage the misuse of a technology that at this point has not yet reached um, 100% guarantee of accuracy. So um, I, I think you've read a lot of stories in the year or more since we last looked at this bill about how sometimes facial recognition has been used positively, but also the incredible injustices that have been caused by the misuse of facial recognition. I believe that this amendment gets us closer to where we want to be and understanding that as the technology improves, if it does improve, we can always make future changes. Um, thank you for uh, permitting me to give my, my testimony. Does anybody on the committee have a question for the representative? Yeah, I do. Rep representative Sitek? Representative Smith, um, with respect to the uh, events at the national capital recently, 
would the police need a warrant to go in to start identifying these people if they thought they were from New Hampshire? Well, there are two answers to that question. The first um, answer, Representative Saite, is what we see going on today is why I have no, I refuse to use social media. What we see is in each and every case, it was the um, perpetrators themselves who took uh, photos of themselves and broadcast it over all of the social media um, uh, sites and therefore are completely out of consideration in this because they are providing their faces and their oral testimony that they were there. Um, in other cases, um, and I believe that it would be necessary for the, um, uh, the appropriate police agency to get um, a warrant, which again, under these circumstances um, would be issued by any uh, authority without any delay. And it is the perfect example of the pluses and the minuses of facial recognition because it can be used um, well and carefully to the benefit of the public good, but it also could be misused. All that this does is require in cases where it's appropriate that the police state why they want a warrant. And um, for those of us who have been following at all what has been going on, we know that that warrant would be forthcoming quickly. Representative Smith, to chase you just a little bit on this, uh, just because they've put their faces on social media does not mean they're, they have been identified. That would still need facial recognition technology. To your first point. Um, yes. That's true, but um, for many of them, they have in fact declared who they are and what they're doing. I also want to say, Representative Sidetech, that although I, that I am not an attorney and um, I don't even play one on TV, <laughs> um, uh, although I probably could, uh, but I don't like facial recognition, so I wouldn't want my picture taken. Um, but I would uh, respectfully suggest that people who are more sophisticated than I about the use of, um, uh, of warrants answer your question uh, because I don't want to mislead someone I respect so much in the legislature. Thank you. It's going to be Representative Shoup followed by Representative Allegra. Representative Shoup. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Smith. Um, kind of following up on uh, Representative Sitek's question, um, I saw on the news last night uh, for the first time, they presented some of the security camera footage from the Capitol itself. Uh, I don't know if those have been used uh, in an attempt to identify some of these folks, but isn't that wouldn't that be prohibited from this bill? I can't answer that question, Representative Stewart. Right, thank you. I think federal law enforcement is exempt from this. Yes, this bill affects the New Hampshire government and the New Hampshire court system. Anything that happened at the federal capital in Washington is not under our control. Question of the chair. Um, in regards to that response, um, we understand that some of the people who did invade the Capitol were from New Hampshire. So this bill will not prevent, um, I'm not sure, I guess, federal authorities from using facial recognition to- No, no. Representative Shue, it would prohibit, it, 
them from bringing a case against that person in New Hampshire courts. It would not affect anything they would do in federal courts, which is where I would suspect they would be bringing such a case. Correct, I believe that. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Allegro. Thank you. A question of Representative Smith. Um, rightly so, I think you you're, you express concerns about the technical shortcomings of uh, facial recognition systems. Um, how does allowing for its use by requiring a warrant, uh, let me rephrase that. How does um, requiring a warrant to allow for its use mitigate against the technical shortcomings that uh, you're concerned about? I, I don't see how it, it does. Um, I, I quite agree with you. I don't think per se that it does. What this bill attempts to acknowledge is that facial recognition is here now, it is being used now, and it can be used for good and it can be used for ill. And not wanting to completely deny the, the existence of, of facial recognition technology and not wanting to completely require um, law enforcement officials to be denied a potential valuable tool. This is a, a measure along the continuum that would require um, law enforcement to stop and think and be sure and be on record as to why they are seeking to use facial recognition. And it is possible in a year or two or 10, um, such a restriction might not be necessary. Uh, by then, who knows, we all might have these little things embedded in our foreheads that you know tell everybody where we are every minute. I'm not counting on that, but it's possible as technology uh, moves along. Meanwhile, we have had too many instances of where facial recognition technology was used casually or without careful forethought and has definitely resulted in, um, in harm to citizens in our, in our country and in our state specifically, but not exclusively, people of color and women. Thank you. Representative Fellows, you had your hand up and you spoke it away. Thank you for a question for either Representative McGuire or um, Smith. In the version that was passed uh, last year by this committee, uh, it included a provision that said it was okay for um, state police to use this technology if they were working in cooperation with federal agents. And so that's not in the new version, either the original or the uh, proposed amendment. So is that just because you think it's not necessary or is by leaving it out, is there, does that change anything? Representative McGuire, do you want to answer that? No, I bow to my experts on that part. I did not work, did not adopt the wording of of that part either in the original bill or in the amendment. And I I would do the same. I would leave it to um, <laughs> the more skilled professionals who will follow me. Thank you, that's all. I thank you, Representative Fellows. The chair is gonna call Mr. Chair. Can I unmute yourself, sir? Um, am, everybody can hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Albert Scher, often called Buzz instead of Albert. 
Uh, I'm a professor at UNH School of Law. I, um, I've been involved in the criminal justice system for 40 years. I've also uh, been very interested in privacy legislation, particularly over the, the last five years. I worked very closely with former Representative uh, Kirk uh, in the drafting of what is now uh, New Hampshire's unique uh, privacy constitutional amendment, part one, article 2B. So I'm very focused uh, broadly on privacy issues. I teach and I write in that area. Uh, the opinions I express today are mine only. They are not the opinions of uh, the University of New Hampshire or the UNH School of Law. Um, just to clear up, I, I have filed written testimony and so I'll, I'll try to be as abbreviated as I can in my presentation so that I can answer some of the more technical questions that, that I've been hearing. Uh, uh, my, my, I, I am noted as opposing HB 499, uh, that's how I signed up. I oppose the current version of HB 499, and I'll explain that when I get to that part of my uh, presentation. I am in support of the amendment that has been filed that is more simple, more clear, uh, and more to the point uh, in dealing with uh, this. That is the amendment that requires uh, a search warrant supported by probable cause issued by an independent and neutral magistrate. So let me give a little context to all of this. I think many of you are personally, at least personally, perhaps professionally familiar with the context. You know, in the, in the 20th century, uh, we really thought about constitutional privacy in terms of the Fourth Amendment, uh, in terms of searches and seizures. And the Fourth Amendment reads like uh, it protects some version of physical privacy, your body, your house, your property, your luggage. That's the, that's the feel and the language of the Fourth, Fourth Amendment. Uh, and that worked fine in the 20th century. When we got to the 21st century, more and more we started dealing with technology that was all about intangible information. What's inside your cell phone? The, uh, the pictures you can derive from uh, facial rec recognition technology. Uh, they're basically uh, fancy information uh, for, you know, surreptitious DNA harvesting where the people, the police follow somebody around and without a warrant sees a cigarette belt, they cast aside and mine it for as much genetic information as they can get. What's at issue there is information rather than the physical item. And it turns out uh, the Fourth Amendment has been in the 21st century kind of clunky uh, in dealing with that. Uh, trying to recognize, well, when you go into somebody's, you know, cells that they have abandoned, does that count as a search? You know, is that covered by the Fourth Amendment? Or when you uh, attach a GPS to the uh, bottom of somebody's truck, you don't enter the truck, you just attach a GPS to the bottom of the truck, the police uh, do that, and then follow it around for 10 days. Is the information they gathered uh, acquired from a search? Uh, that uh, protected by the Fourth Amendment or not. So we've run into these kind of problems when we're talking about information privacy. The Fourth Amendment has been kind of clunky in figuring out whether, whether the police need a warrant, whether they don't need a warrant. So, uh, and facial recognition technology is a part of that. It gathers, as I described, a kind of information. Uh, and, you know, it gathers information from somebody in public. You know, and part of what the discussion has been uh, in court cases and among privacy uh, scholars and others uh, and activists has been, do you completely abandon all privacy uh, of any sort when you go into public? You know, can the police mine your uh, the saliva and the cells on your, on your cigarette butt that you cast aside uh, for all sorts of whatever genetic information they want without having to get a warrant to do that. You know, can they follow you, you know, secretly put a GPS on the bottom of your car and follow you around for as long as they want without ever having to get a warrant and use that information for whatever purpose they want. And uh, that, you know, and those are all, you know, privacy in public questions and facial recognition technology is another privacy in public uh, problem. Um, it's, 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 I'll, now let me, um, 
let me talk briefly about the reliability issue, although I agree with uh, Representative Smith that uh, this bill is not a perfect bill. I was in, in, in strong support of the original bill last session that passed this committee uh, uh, with a solid majority um, that, that, that put greater brakes on uh, official recognition technology than the bills we're working with now. Um, and I appreciate that that's a compromise. Uh, it's an imperfect compromise, but I think it's a it's very important to move forward in this way in, uh, with the uh, uh, with um, uh, with the amendment to HB 499 as it's now written. Uh, my my tech my written testimony talks in more depth about the re reliability issues, so I won't go into that anymore. Um, I, I, I'm in strong opposition to HB 499 as it's currently written, because it is a pro uh, facial recognition bill. It allows the police to do whatever facial recognition, use facial recognition technology, however they want to surveil someone for 72 hours. They don't need a warrant. They don't need to tell anybody. Uh, they don't need to get approval of any sort for 72 hours under the, uh, eight, the current HB 499, uh, they can do whatever they want. Only after 72 hours do they start to have some, some requirements uh, to get a court order. But the requirements that, they're, that, that are imposed on them are completely vague and uh, troubling, actually. Number one, it requires uh, a, the, a police officer, law enforcement, to get a court order. It doesn't say that a court order is a warrant. It doesn't say that to get a court order, you need probable cause. It doesn't say what, uh, what standards the judge should use in terms of what are the criteria. If you don't need probable cause, what are the criteria to get a court order? It's completely vague. Uh, it, it apparently studiously avoids saying they got to get a search warrant. Um, um, so, uh, and then further, it creates an exception to that practice, as vague as it is. Uh, it says, but a police officer, if he has or she has exigent circumstances, can, can go ahead and uh, engage in uh, facial recognition surveillance, uh, as long as they have reasonable grounds to believe they could get a court order. Remember, this is a court order that doesn't require probable cause. Now, Exigent circumstances is a term of art in the legal world, particularly in the criminal justice system. There is a well-known exception to the warrant requirement that allows in exigent circumstances where there's no time to get a warrant and there's serious risks involved and officer has probable cause, it allows the officer to act without getting a warrant. The exigent circumstances exception in HB 499 it doesn't require probable cause. It dispenses with the critical requirement for use of the exigent circumstances exception under the Fourth Amendment of uh, the U.S. Constitution and Part One, Article 19 of the New Hampshire Constitution. So uh, there are other problems I've talked about in my uh, written testimony, but I think I think uh, HB 499, as currently written, uh, is really in. Uh, intended or otherwise, it creates the illusion of imposing any kind of regulation of any substance uh, on facial recognition and surveillance and technology. And so I strongly oppose it. That said, the amendment uh, that uh, offered by uh, uh, Representative Smith and, 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 and Chair McGuire um, is, uh, I think, is a, is a strong effort to start to regulate uh, uh, facial recognition technology. It's simple, it's clear, it's, uh, it's to the point. Uh, it requires that the police get a search warrant supported by probable cause issued by a neutral and independent magistrate. As Representative Smith said, it, uh, you can get warrants very quickly in these days of high technology, uh, number one. Uh, 
Number two, just to use as an example, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the members of the committee referred to uh, the capital circumstance. Um, I think Representative Smith was right in that when people you know, put their, uh, their uh, uh, pictures of themselves on social media websites or, or have them on their cell phone and offer them up to friends, uh, you know, you don't need a warrant because they've already identified themselves as in the picture. To the extent there are other people in the picture committing offenses in the picture that are unidentifiable, all the police would need to do, all the DC police would need to do, or the FBI would need to do, was get a warrant and say, I want to use facial recognition technology to, uh, to identify these people and I'm, I have probable cause to believe they're committing a crime because they're doing it in front of my very eyes in the, in the video uh, clip that I have in front of me. So please give me a search warrant. Every judge that I've ever been in front of will give you a search warrant in that circumstance. So it wouldn't get in the way at all of the investigation of the, uh, uh, the so-called insurrection uh, involving the Capitol because a crime... It, and very often with facial recognition technology used well, you have a picture of somebody committing a crime. So all you need to put in the warrant is the person in this picture is committing or has committed a crime. I have probable cause to believe that because it's right there in the picture. Please give me a warrant so I can use facial recognition technology to identify them. Very simple process and very easy to get in those circumstances. Um, uh, to respond uh, to uh, what uh, the question Representative Fellows asked, um, this wouldn't get in the way of the New Hampshire police cooperating with federal agents and, and working in New Hampshire. All it would require is if they have uh, surveillance video of somebody involved in criminal activity or they have probable cause to believe the person in the picture is involved in criminal activity, they'll be able to get a warrant um, in New Hampshire courts. Uh, so uh, the beauty of uh, the amendment offered by Representative Smith and, uh, and Representative McGuire is it's simple, it's clear, it uses a mechanism that the police are completely familiar with. Police in New Hampshire get warrants very quickly on a daily basis. Uh, even on a nightly basis, um, at waking judges up to get warrants. So um, I am, um, uh, I am, uh, I'm very much in support of the uh, uh, the amendment proposed to HB 499, and I am very much opposed to uh, the original um, uh, HB 499. And I ask the committee to vote ought to pass on the amendment to HB 499. And we're willing to answer any questions. I have uh, Representative Schmidt has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your uh, very lucid testimony uh, and very cogent testimony. I have two questions. One of them is a slight technicality, and the other one is uh, more profound, I think. So, question number one um, you. Um, it, Earlier testimony was stated that the, uh, the bill only references the state, but as I read lines 18 and 19 of the bill, um, the, that's 18 and 19 on page one, uh, the, um, the state is defined as not only what we would consu consider to be the state that is state of New Hampshire, but also its subdivisions, namely, you know, City of Dover, the Police Department of Durham, you name it. Is that, uh, am I reading it correctly? Correct. Thank you. So the second question is more profound. And one of the concerns that I have had and I had when I was the, uh, the chairman of the subcommittee that worked on the previous bill um, was that uh, if this, if this, uh, if the statute were permitted uh, permitted the use of facial rec recognition technology, that it would be probably irresistible for towns uh, to put up cameras um, on the, you know, in the public way uh, and photograph people going about their business 
engaged in no crimes whatsoever, but creating an enormous data uh, trove that could be mined by facial recognition technology to identify everybody that was in those pictures. Is that, would that, would that be correct in, in, uh, in your view? Uh, no, uh, yes and no, actually, or no and yes would be the best way to put it. Uh, this bill does not directly prohibit towns and municipalities from putting up cameras and recording everybody going about their daily business and putting it in a huge uh, storage database, although uh, what would limit the towns, practically speaking, is the amount of money it would cost to store all that data, but the, all those videos. But putting that issue aside, what this bill says is, uh, uh, effectively to your question, you can you can collect all that video you want, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day of people moving about downtown Dover, right? You can collect all of that, put aside the cost of the storage issue. But if you want to go in there and find out who somebody is, you need a search warrant supported by probable cause issued by a neutral independent magistrate. You, before you can use facial recognition technology, to go in there and identify someone, you need to establish that you have reason to believe, uh, you have probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed and by identifying that person uh, in the video that you're, you're showing the judge, you would be able, you would gain evidence uh, for investigating this crime, solving this crime. So in theory, you could create that video database, but you can't access it just randomly and, and say, hey, I wanna find out who that person is. You you need to you need to get the warrant to access it. I hope that follow up, Mr. Follow yeah. up, Mr. Chair. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Mr. Schmidt, follow up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So the the scenario that we've just been discussing, Professor, um, is is it the case that uh, that that the um, that the e the ease of obtaining a, a warrant would be trumped by the, the fact that this tremendous database that, the, that the, the town of Dover hypothetically could have created uh, by putting up a camera, that, the, um, that the, the, the state in, uh, the entity, in this case, uh, the police department of Dover, or the uh, Dover de detectives, uh, the Dover courts could not um, authorize the, uh, the the town to begin to search that trove um, in order to, to see whether uh, an individual that they're interested in were were, were visible there uh, could not get that warrant uh, because they couldn't they couldn't demonstrate uh, you know in, initially that the person uh, uh, that the person was there. And therefore, they couldn't e even begin to investigate using FRT. Correct. They couldn't. They would have to have probable cause to believe that looking for the presence of that person in the massive, the theoretical massive database uh, would lead to the probable cause to believe that a crime has been or was being committed and that by finding this person in that database, uh, they would gain evidence uh, uh, in the investigation of that crime. So it would be, you know, just the police scanning through this database to see what uh, uh, Peter Schmidt was doing uh, the last week. And just as a matter of, you know, we don't trust Schmidt and we want to kind of figure out what he's been doing. They can't do that. They would need probable cause to believe that Schmidt had committed a crime um, and that using identifying Schmidt in those, in those, uh, video, uh, those, those surveillance videos would lead to evidence of a crime. So mm -hmm. it, while if once you have the probable cause, it's easy to get the warrant, it's not easy to get to probable cause. It, this bill prohibits by requiring there be the threshold of probable cause to be met. This prohibits just the random scanning of databases. Thank you. I think I'm going to continue to social distance in my house so that my face will not be out on the street there. Thank you very much for your testimony. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Smith, and thank you, Ms. Professor Scher. <clears throat>
Is there any? Well, we've run into a time constraint. We are now at 11.30. We will recess this hearing to 11 a.m. on the 18th of February. I'm going to close the public hearing on 499, and my apologies to the remaining three folks that wish to speak. I will also be turning the chair back over to Chair McGuire. I have a question of the chair. Yes. I had, thank you. I had just raised my hand uh, for a question of Mr. Scher. Will he be attending that recessed hearing? I may ask my question then. Yes, sir. Would you rather have the question now or we can reopen the hearing for one question? I'm willing to answer the question now, uh, uh, but I also will be at the, the February 18th hearing. Okay, I believe it's just a brief question, Madam Chair. The hearing on House Bill 499. Representative Shewitt, your question. Uh, Mr. Chair, would this have any effect on the body cams that uh, police officers are beginning to wear now? Well, interestingly, if you read my uh, written testimony, um, uh, uh, there's the, the, one of, the, the, one of the, the biggest provider of body cams uh, uh, in the United States to police departments has made, consulted with its uh, expert ethics board, an independent entity, and that expert, uh, Axon Corporation is the name of the corporation, and their expert panel of scientists and uh, ethics experts has said, don't use this right now. It's not reliable. Uh, and I, I, I go into more detail in that in uh, my written testimony. So uh, that's where things are now as to body camps. All right, thank you very much uh, for taking my question and thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to ask. Thank you, Representative Shewitt, and thank you, Professor Scher. I do hope you will be able to rejoin us next week. Uh, I will do so, thank you. Okay, reclosing the hearing on House Bill 499, which is recessed until 11 o'clock on the 18th, next Thursday. Opening the hearing on House Bill 544, relative to the propagation of divisive concepts, and I call Representative Ammon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Keith Ammon. I represent Hillsborough District 40, which is the towns of New Boston, Mount Vernon, Milford, and Hollis. I'm introducing House Bill 544, and I'm doing so recognizing that the topics the bill covers are controversial. The origins of this bill uh, came from, the idea for the bill came from a professor at one of our state universities who wishes to remain anonymous due to fear of backlash. So I will, I, will be, I will not be divulging who that person is. And the idea for this bill uh, is to set policy guidelines for state institutions. And which is why House Bill 544 amends Section 10 of the RSAs, which cover state institutions, also why the bill is before uh, this committee. The bill does not uh, do the following things. It does not apply to private institutions with the caveat unless they choose to contract with the state institution. It does not ban diversity and inclusion training. It does not limit academic discussion and it does not limit free speech. And I, I will uh, uh, be happy to address any of those. Uh, you can see uh, by reading the bill uh, that those things are true. So I, I understand that the committee uh, has probably read the bill in advance, but for the record, I'd like to read at least some of the sections in the bill so that it is on the record, because I think there are some misconceptions about this bill floating around. Um, this bill addresses something called critical race theory. And it is an ideology that is uh, espoused by some people 
And the root of the ideology is that the United States is fundamentally racist and founded in racism. And that uh, people are born uh, inherently oppressors and that others are born to be inherently oppressed. So I'm gonna turn your attention to uh, 10C colon one, Roman numeral two, that's the divisive concept list. And I'm just gonna read through some of these. I'll do it as uh, in a reasonable pace so it doesn't take too much time. Divisive concepts means that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. The state of New Hampshire or the United States is fundamentally racist or sexist. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. An individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. Members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. An individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. Meritocracy or traits such as hard work or as a hard work ethic are racist or sexist and were created by a particular race to oppress another race. And then finally, the term divisive concepts includes any other form of race or sex stereotyping or any other form of race or sex scapegoating. And those terms are defined uh, also in that section. So those are the, I those are the ideas um, that are termed divisive in this bill because they don't unify our country or society. They break us up into different camps. Uh, we know that in the American tradition, we're all equal, uh, regardless of race or sex. And uh, though the United States was not perfect in the beginning, the country has advanced to where we're able to talk about uh, a better, uh, more unity and more equality. But these ideas are akin, uh, you've probably heard the term <coughs> snake oil salesman. So there's a new industry uh, that's popped up that is not regulated very well. Uh, and I'm not asking for it to be regulated, but it's a diversity training or inclusion training. Uh, and there, there's an aspect of that industry that promotes the ideas listed in the divisive concept list. And it's, I, I would liken it to, uh, to snake oil as a, uh, you know, proposing to cure a disease, but in actuality, it's even making it worse. And so as uh, the legislature, it's our job to set policy for state institutions and what uh, types of training are appropriate in the hierarchy of the state institutions. So moving on in the bill, the requirements for the state of New Hampshire, that's section 10 C colon two, Roman one requirements. The bill simply bans that the state of New Hampshire, the institutions under that umbrella shall not teach, instruct or train any employee contractor or staff member student or any other individual group to adopt or believe any of the divisive concepts. So adopt or believe uh, would be an, a form of advocacy. And then no employee, contractor, staff member, or student of the state of New Hampshire shall face any penalty or discrimination on account of his or her refusal to support, believe, endorse, embrace, confess, act upon, or otherwise assent to the divisive concepts listed. That section uh, B, I think, got the attention of our professor friend uh, that uh, there is penalty and discrimination happening. 
And then this next section talks about requirements for contractors. So if your tax dollars went to pay for a contractor, uh, the, one of the strings attached would be uh, that they uh, just w would choose not to promote these traits within their organization. And then it talks about labor unions. And then it talks about on the next page, uh, C, what if a contractor is not compliant? The bill generally leaves uh, discretion up to the Department of Administrative Services uh, to decide how and what um, uh, enforcement actions would be attached to this bill, including with contractors and subcontractors. So Roman numeral three, the Department of Administrative Services uh, is directed to investigate complaints uh, received. So that's where the enforcement would come in and decide of appropriate enforcement and provide remedial relief as appropriate. Section four is, is a, a critical piece of the bill. It directs the heads of state agencies to review grant programs and identify programs uh, for which the agency may, as a requirement of the agency, uh, have the recipient certify that they uh, are not willing to promote these divisive concepts. And then uh, it talks about requirements for age agencies. And I'm gonna read this line because it's very critical. It says the fair and equal treatment of individuals is an inviolable principle that must be maintained in the state workplace. Agencies should continue all training that will foster a workplace that is respectful of all employees. And then it directs the head of each agency to develop a policy to that effect. And it talks about the definition of training. And then uh, number two there, it says, agency diversity and inclusion efforts shall first and foremost encourage agency employees not to judge each other by their color, race, ethnicity, sex, or any other characteristic protected by federal or state law. And that the commissioner of the Department of Administrative Services shall develop regulations for the enforcement of the provisions of the statute. So I, I, won't, I won't belabor the rest of the points here, but I do want to turn your attention to the general provisions section. It says nothing in this chapter shall prevent agencies or contractors from promoting racial, cultural, or ethnic diversity or inclusiveness, provided such efforts are consistent with the requirements of this chapter. Roman two says nothing in this chapter shall be construed to prohibit discussing as part of a larger course of academic instruction, the divisive concepts listed, but they'd have to be done so in an objective manner without endorsement. Again, that's the endorsement part is trying to convince other people to believe in the divisive concepts using your position of authority. And uh, I would ask that any opponents of this bill you would ask them which of the divisive concepts they support. I think that would be a key question. And this bill is really a bill about, uh, about unity, that we're all equal. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have a couple, more than one question, Madam Chair, depending on his answers, if that's okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative Ammon, um, do you believe that systemic racism exists today in America? Do I believe that it's systemic? Does that mean the system is inherently racist? Is that the question? Does systemic racism exist? Can you define systemic? Uh, systemic would be that uh, the remnants of slavery and racist beliefs have been codified and uh, normalized in existing systems of government and business and society in general? No. no it exists nowhere. 
No, I, I'm, I'm saying it's not systemic. It does exist. There are vestiges of it. And our country has done a very good job rooting out those last vestiges. But do I think that the structure of our country is racist by design? No. So do think. you acknowledge the institutionalized racism of the three-fifths compromise of the Constitutional Convention of the United States? So. No. Could you familiarize me with that? Is that the two-thirds compromise? Yes, it is. That has been uh, rectified since. And it, slavery is one of the original sins of our country. But the design of the country, the divine, design of the institutions of the country, have allowed our country to evolve in, in, and to rectify those sins of the past. So it's, that proves that it's not uh, by design. I think it proves the opposite of your point. Interesting. I have so many more questions, but I know there are other people that want to ask questions. I just, uh, just one comes to mind as well, because your bill also addresses sexuality. Um, it, it addresses sex, so that would be a biological definition. Biological and gender. It doesn't. It does not address gender. So that's interesting. Is there a specific um, sexual, uh, biological sex then that you are concerned about here? Does that mean intersex or people born with different chromosomal differences that are not binary? That are that kind of biology? It doesn't address any of that. It addresses whether you're male or female, and that would be your biological sex. Okay, one more, even though I probably could ask a hundred more. Um, uh, so it uh, doesn't bother you that uh, researchers have shown that modern day society in America has inherent bias against people for a number of reasons, including race and biological sex. Yes, and that's why this bill uh, eliminates that or attempts to eliminate that and put the discussion on a level playing field that people shouldn't be uh, biased against because of their race or sex. That, so those, that, that, that that idea is antithetical to America. I have so many more questions, but I don't want to monopolize. Thank you, Representative Schultz, I think. Representative Judy, you have a question? You'll have to unmute yourself. Right now. Okay, I, I'm, I, yes, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry about that, Madam Chair. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a straight question. Are you yeah. a racist? Uh, I'm sorry. Are you a racist if you are a racist person? I'm, I'm really sorry, I don't understand. Religious person? No, no, Rac racist. Am I a racist person? Yes. I don't believe so. And I'll tell you a little reason why I don't believe that. Um, I was raised in a faith. Uh, it's called the Jehovah's Witness faith. And it's probably the most integrated uh, congregation. And it's an international congregation. So uh, when I was growing up, uh, we regularly had fellowship with people of all races. And so that's my experience. That's the way it should be. And promoting divisions is toxic to that. And so that's my position. Uh, <clears throat> follow up, Madam Chair. Follow up. Uh, I receive uh, so many e email by my constituents in New Hampshire, around New Hampshire. And they ask me, firmly to be against this bill, HB 544. Okay. Because... Uh, uh, and your question is? My question is, why that person stay behind the scene? 
why the person, you, you mean the professor? professor? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, she or he is worried about retribution and losing their job for advocating this uh, in their in their personal life, and I'll I'll read you a piece of an e- of, of an email that I received, and this person made emphasis. Uh, I am required to inform you that I am a professor at X Y Z New Hampshire Public University, and uh, and I'm I'm redacting that, but am writing you, to you as a private citizen on behalf and not on behalf of XYZ Private University. And the reason that they don't want to be known is because they're worried about losing their job and that academic uh, freedom really doesn't exist or is or losing it uh, in, in at least the public university system. Follow up, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Follow up, please. You've you've been muted, Representative Judy. Please unmute yourself. Right now, I'm okay. Right now. Now you're okay. Okay. So that means uh, he or she he knows what he's winning here. It's wrong. Uh, Representative Judy, you can't assume their motives. But anyway, anyway Madam Chair, um, everyone who are listening to me, I am really offended by HB 544. Enough is enough. We live in the earth like an egg. I don't think breaking the egg will be good for any race or any man or any woman. Again, may I, may I, ask I, a am, really, I am really offended. May I ask a question? We don't, I'm not going to answer any question because I am really offended uh, as a black person. What, what are you offended also, by? What also, aspects are you offended by? Also, I am proud of myself to come from Haiti to become here in the United States without speaking English to become a state representative. Welcome. So, so no, you don't have to welcome me. So, yes. EDNA already welcomed me. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Brien, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative, for uh, taking my question. Uh, I am kind of concerned uh, with my background, and I'm, uh, let me preface by saying uh, most of the union contracts that are established, uh, one of the first articles uh, or the second article within the agreement or at some point, it does say we'll abide by the laws, the U.S. constitutions, and by the laws of that particular state. Taking that into account, looking at what you are submitting here, from line on page two, line 36 down to line 18, you have gotten quite explicit in going into some of the things with the uh, union uh, contracts. Most of the unions believe in a cohesive bonding of a brotherhood or sisterhood. Do you feel that this current bill could jeopardize that in particular? And if I could have your opinions of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I've never been in a union, so I can't speak from experience on that. Um, the idea is generally that state money, if it went to fund a union, that they would follow these basic guidelines that uh, uh, you shouldn't be discriminated against based on race or sex. If they're already doing that, then maybe that's not uh, a requirement in the bill. The, the, I think the fundamental piece in the bill is state institutions. 
and that the contractors, uh, the unions are kind of a secondary aspect. Uh, and mainly because they receive funding from state institutions and they operate at the request and direction of state institutions in, in, in the capacity of performing a function for the state. Does that make sense? It does. And if I may follow up, Madam Chair, briefly. Um, you, you mentioned that the uh, unions receive funding and just as a point of correction, in my knowledge that I believe that uh, there is no funding from the state of New Hampshire into any of the unions that have any collective bargainings in the state. They are independent and they're under the laws uh, guided by the state of New Hampshire, but there is no funding mechanism. I see. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to uh, improving the bill. So if that's something that can be improved by leaving that out, um, you know, I would be open to that. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. There's a lot of other people with questions. I'll yield. Thank you. Yes. Uh, speaking of that, it is almost noon. We will complete the questions for Representative Hammond and then recess this hearing until... 1.30 on Thursday the 18th, and I apologize to all the people that came out for it, but this bill is much more complicated than it seemed at the beginning. Representative Schmidt, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Indeed, I do. Representative Ammon, thank you for being with us this morning. I read your bill carefully, and I see that, that it makes a number of categorical statements, um, which I think are unarguable, uh, that in the absolute, uh, the, uh, the statement that no one is better or worse because of their gender, their race, uh, their sex, and uh, their origin, whatever. Uh, I, but uh, so the, 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 the categorical statements. So. If 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 the um, if the uh, if the bill is passed, uh, can it actually contribute to a, an improvement of the situation that we currently find ourselves in? Because your earlier testimony does say uh, that you recognize that there there is racism, sexism, ageism, and so forth out there um, that uh, that society is working on. Uh, but do you really feel that, that your bill provides a modality for, to, for getting to a better uh, situation, and a better process than we are currently engaged in? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think this puts guidelines on uh, what, what are the limits, especially under the auspices of the state apparatus. That's really what this is about. Uh, what are the limits uh, in presuming that someone has, uh, someone was born to be an oppressor? That's really like the, the underlying thing of this. Or someone was born to be oppressed. Uh, because of their race or sex. That's the underlying thing. If that's the assumption that we're going to make as a society, then I think we never get to unity. Um, and so that these, this, this list is a set of guidelines on what's appropriate in, in, in state institutions for having that discussion. Does that make sense? It does. You, you realize we're up against a time deadline yeah. here. Are you willing to come back? Because this is a this is a colloquy that needs to continue. And sure. your testimony and helping us to understand your bill and your purpose is important. Can you come back when the bill is uh, is taken up again? I'd be happy to. And and I'm acknowledging that this is a difficult discussion. Uh, and I appreciate the intellect of everyone on the committee to look at this issue and decide what policies should be in place uh, for, you know, the, the state agencies, especially. So 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ammon. Are there other questions for Representative Ammon before we uh, we close? Madam Chair, I just wanted to reiterate what Peter Sh Representative Schmidt was saying. I would really appreciate it if the sponsors could join us when we reconvene, whatever day and time that will be, because I think we may have more questions for them. Thank you. The uh, and to all the members of the of the community who are raising their hands repeatedly, I am not going to invite you to speak because the governor has scheduled his budget address to start right about now. And we need to take a break. This meeting will be resumed at 1.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 18th. I hope all of you will be able to join us then, and I'm sorry for the delay, but. When will the committee resume, Madam Chair? What's that? When will the committee resume today? I haven't gotten there yet, but the next hearing is at 1.30, excuse me, one fifteen. Thank you. Okay. And we will resume at 1.15 for the next bill. And I hope we'll be able to complete some of the hearings today. Thank you. We're in recess. Nice, nice sample of some of the interesting things in the table. Excuse me, everyone in the committee room. Uh, I just want you to know that I have muted the um, the sound, uh, so I can't hear you if you're if you respond to me. But I just want you to know it's muted, and somebody will need to unmute when you resume at one fifteen. Thanks a lot. We are hearing you, Pam. If you can hear me, can you send a link to the governor's budget address? I don't know where it is. Okay, thank you.
Yep. Yep. She just had the sound. Ben, if you're there, can you hear us? I can't hear you. Test the mic's chair. Is that coming through? Sounds loud and clear. Um, Pam. <laughs> Pam going once? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I'm here. I was distracted by uh, an echo in YouTube. <laughs> You, uh, I did not get the uh, testimony page. I have them at home and I'm willing to fill them out after the fact. Do you want me to do that? You did not get the testimony page. What do you mean? Uh, the record of the hearing, uh, who was present, time open, time closed. I can do that at home and submit it when next time I'm here. The question is whether you want me to do that. Can I read off the sheets? Um, that's fine. You know, I think I are you, double check in the paperwork that I brought down. I don't think I separated out quite. I think there were four different documents, and I think I only made three piles out of them. I. I have only uh, yeah. the attendance, which I'm now out of. I roll call sheets. Give the one minute warning. I one have minute warning. the executive session summary sheet of uh, what was uh, the motions. Uh, the roll call. I do not have the sheet opens everything. When the what bill number? When this hearing opened? When the hearing closed? list of members and the testimony which i i don't fill in but i uh, email it's that page i don't have okay well I'll, I'll ask miriam to print them out and um you know it's certainly whatever you it, you know you can do it at home obviously clearly but um i'll try to get copies of the Not, hearing sheets is what you're looking for sorry to print it out i'll do it at home if she's okay. willing to wait till my next appearance Okay, yes, I think that would be fine. Okay, great, that's all. Okay, thanks. All right, fabulous, the time is now 1.15. We're gonna open the hearing on House Bill 606. And the chair recognizes the bill's prime sponsor, Representative McGuire. Good afternoon, I'm Carol McGuire, representing Merrimack District 29, which is the towns of Allenstown, Epsom and Pittsfield. And House Bill 606 exempts from the current criminal status of, via, of performing cosmetology, barbering, or, or, or aesthetics without a license, if, you, if it is not for pay. Uh, this came out during the early stages of the shutdown in March and April when barbershops and beauty salons were declared to be non-essential. And a lot of us started looking awfully shaggy and others uh, illegally went to a friend and got their hair cut. And that generated a fair amount of ridicule that they were being criminals by getting their hair cut by a neighbor instead of a, uh, a licensed professional. And right now, our, our laws do not make any exceptions whatsoever on this criminality. It is a crime for a group of preteen girls to get together and play with you. It is a crime to cut your baby's fingernails. And so as long this bill simply says, if you're not getting paid, it's not a crime. It may be ill-advised, but... Uh, that's your choice. You, the state has no, no, this state would have no interest in controlling or regulating uh, free, free actions. The last time this came up, the board said, oh, but we'd never prosecute somebody for cutting their husband's hair or, or whatever. And I strongly object to that policy because I think that if it's on the books as a crime, it should be enforced as a crime. And I would be 
and in many cases, I, I object to having laws that are selectively enforced. And I would hope you all do too. Anyway, it's a very simple bill. I'll answer any questions I can. Up at the end of it's titled Executive Departments, which I thought we fixed earlier. Which I thought we fixed earlier. Um, so, who is that on the screen that has their hand up under Executive Departments? I have my hand up. Is that you, me you're referring to? That's going to be you, Representative. Go for it. Thank you. So first of all, Representative McGuire, um, is it a crime or a violation? Speaker B. According to the current statute, it is a class A misdemeanor. Is, it, is that technically a crime or a misdemeanor? It is a crime. It is not a felony unless you are a non-natural person that is a business. So if you set up a illicit salon as an LLC or whatever, that would be a felony. If you simply uh, cut somebody's hair as an individual, that's a, a class A misdemeanor. Follow up? Yep, follow up. Thank you. So if uh, your bill were to pass, um, are you concerned about the fact that it opens the door for um, all kinds of serious violations of the requirement that people performing these uh, actions, these services, uh, be trained and competent? No. Hey, follow up. Okay. So, are you aware that? Uh, the people who are practitioners under the law, legal practitioners, um, see lots of openings for illegal activity, which would be, uh, you know, uh, the class A misdemeanors at the very least. Uh, yes, I understand the cosmetologists, et cetera, are violently opposed to this, but I can't see that anyone is going to be doing very much without remuneration, except for their friends or family. And if you go to any drugstore or Walmart or wherever and walk through the beauty products, you will see row after row of hair dyes, permanents, styling aids, etc. Not to mention nail polish, which is also applying nail polish is also a uh, part of this, this uh, chapter. These products are available for the public. There is no crime to, it is not a crime to sell them or to use them on yourself, but right now it is a crime to use them on somebody else. Okay, thank you. Representative Fellows. Thank you. Um, Representative McGuire, I'm wondering if you, might recall, not so much this past year, but before, seeing on TV um, things about people who donate their hair to go to um, making wigs, and that there's a cosmetologist there who, who styles their hair so it looks nice after the ponytail's cut off. And then another example I can think of is um, it's not uncommon, particularly in schools, for um, the male teachers to grow a beard and they do it for fundraising for some kind of charity. And usually, I mean, sometimes they cut their own, but sometimes they get a professional shave. So I don't you think that there, there are times when um, people have an expectation that they're getting a professional service from somebody who knows all the, how to, um, all the rules related to sanitation? Yes, and anyone who is setting themselves up as a barber or a esthetician or a cosmetologist is 
required to be licensed. However, if you're if if you're playing with makeup with your uh, your teenage friends, or you're cut or you're cutting your husband's hair because he can't get to the barber shop, I mean that may be ill advised. I cut my husband's hair and he's it's still recovering, but it's not. It should not be a crime. Well, just follow up. Yeah. So so what I'm saying is that these. Um, beauticians, cosmeticians, whatever their, their technical title is, that they are, it's not uncommon that they are cutting the hair of people that they don't know and or, the, or shaving a beard of somebody that they don't know because it's in connection with one of these chair, chair running, raising money for a charity. So Representative Pillows, this does not prohibit a licensed cosmetologist or whatever from performing these acts for free or for charity. That's up between them and, and their business. This is for, for non-professionals to help their friends and neighbors and their family. I, I understand your intent, but the way it's worded, a, cos, a cosmetician who don't, my, the thing is that the, the expectation of the people who are getting their hair cut or getting their beard shaved for a charity, that the person that's doing that ought to know what they're doing. And their assumption would be that, they, that the person does, but you're saying just anybody can come in and do this. Point of order. Stand by Representative Fowles. Representative Lego, your point of order. We're still ascribing uh, to people who we don't know, and in this case are theoretically in existence, uh, that they that they expect to get professional care or something like this. Uh, and, and I should just leave it at that. Yes. We cannot ascribe intentions to other people. Representative Fellows, I, I had a talk with, with my hair cutter, and she was doing a charity event, and her license was prominently mentioned in the advertisement, even though she was doing it for free. She was only doing things she was trained and actually licensed to do. And I, that is the case in other charity events. Uh, I follow up again. Yep, go ahead, I, I, I'm not sure that um, we can be sure that that's what happens in all charity events. But in that case, if you think that that's an exception, do you want to make, would you consider making an amendment to this bill that says that? About the charity events and displaying your credentials and, or, or do you wanna make it, make it a requirement that, that the charity events only use a licensed cosmetician for this kind of thing? No, Representative Fellows, I want to leave that up to the charities. I think they can decide on their own who they want to have doing the, the hair trimming or whatever. And they are aware of the training requirements for, for cosmetologists and barbers. And I'm sure they can get licensed individuals. And I, that's all I'm going to say about it. Well, thank you for taking my question. Thank you. Actually, I have a, the chair will have a question for Representative McGuire. Um, I went to college at Oklahoma State University where for some incredibly amazing reason, 90% of the women in Oklahoma have blonde hair. Now you and I and all of us know that there's no way that that's actually true. So <laughs> when the sororities or, the, or the, the dorm units or whatever, when they have events where the, where the, the girls or even in the sense of the guys are dyeing each other's hair, is that a crime currently in New Hampshire? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Because that, that occurs on a very regular basis. Uh, so thank you for the clarity. Uh, Representative Shewitt, did you have your hand up? Can you took it down? Yes, I did. But I put my hand back down, I think. I was thinking to ask has been covered. <clears throat> covered. 
Okay, great. Thank you. If there, if the committee has no more questions for Representative McGuire, we will move on to a, another speaker. I will. The chair is going to call Vinny Bayoshetti. I hope I didn't butcher that, sir. Bayoshetti. How's that, Your Honor, uh, Chairman? It's your name. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Chair and members of the committee, my name is Vinny Bayaketti. I'm a barber licensed in the state of New Hampshire, and I'm here to testify in opposition of HB 606. If you want to allow mom and dad to cut their kids' hair or their, their, uh, their spouse's hair, or take some box coloring or, or do their hair, paint their fingernails, I don't have a problem with that as a trained professional. It's the allowing of unlicensed people to cut hair, individuals' hair, wax, put chemicals on people's skin and scalp, with no education or training in the safety and proper use of these services that I have an issue with. Just because I watch a video and practice on my friends doesn't make me a professional in any of these three categories. And this is not a money issue. This is, there's plenty of work to go around. But I would caution you that this is the safety, this is for the safety and sanitation issues and preventing people from becoming ill or severely injured. And that's our top priority. A licensed barber, cosmetologist, or esthetician must go through an approved course or, or even a, an apprenticeship. And in our training, we provide, we learn to provide these services, but we also learn and are tested on sanitation, chemistry, anatomy, and physiology, as well as issues with and diseases of the scalp, the skin, hair diseases that are primarily associated with follicles of the hair, uh, head lice, dermatitis, how to properly mix chemicals so the hair in the head of the person is not burned or scarred, alopecia, folliculitis, just to name a few. And we also learn the sanitation prevent, uh, procedures to prevent the spread of diseases, such as HIV, hepatitis, staph infections, fungal infections, bacterial infections, lice, tetanus, and again, just to name a few. These services that we provide are actually pretty significant. I'm a traveling barber. Most of my clients are in medical facilities, correctional facilities, or, or elderly and infirmed and are unable to leave their house. This kind of service is allowed by law. I not only have proper equipment to cut my, uh, my client's hair and shave their faces, and perform the services that I'm allowed to and was trained for, but my instruments, combs, and other equipment are properly cleaned and sanitized after every service, helping to prevent the, the spread of the disease and causing illness or injury to clients. I've also done the charity um, circuit too. You do need to be licensed for that and we can get a permit. They don't charge us from, from uh, OPLC for that. I would suggest that if this bill be changed to allow the services to be provided by and to immediate family members only, and I'd ask that you oppose this bill as written and voted ITL. Um, thank you for your time and attention in this manner. And if I can answer any questions, I would be more than happy to. Representative Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question now. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Biachetti. Hi, Representative Schumann, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, you mentioned that you have performed your services in. Uh, excuse me, somebody's cutting in here. Um, <laughs> let me continue with my question. Uh, you mentioned that you've performed your services in settings such as uh, jails and um, communal areas. So I'll put it that way. Yes. Uh, in doing that, have you, uh, in the process, discovered, um, for example, head lice or diseases or something that you were able to treat or recommend treatment for that have prevented transmission of those to other people? I have. Um, we don't. We don't treat, and we don't cut hair. If we notice lice or the or the nits. Um, eggs, we don't, we don't cut hair after that. It's, it's stopped. Um, and then I, I found it in an inmate in, um, in a correctional facility and then, you know, discreetly said, you know, come on over here and then gave them to the CO and, um, they took care of it from there. But I have found that as well as other, other, uh, conditions that I've not cut hair because I don't want to cause any more problems or issues. And for the follow up, Mr. Chair. Yep. Thank you. Um, if um, if an amateur were doing this, are there some conditions that I'm understanding your concern is that they wouldn't recognize these problems 
or might continue to go ahead and cut the hair, which would then aid um, the disease being transmitted. Oh, absolutely. Um, I do a lot of, I, and I do a lot of razor work. So I shave people, um, you know, I'm exposed to, to other people's blood sometimes. I don't make that a habit, um, but you know, you, you have to know how to treat that or, or how to prevent the spread of that, how to contam or prevent the contamination and prevent the cross contamination. Also, you'll know that you'll, you know, if you have uh, scalp conditions or um, you mismix uh, chemicals and put them on the, on the body and it burns the body, uh, if, if you don't do it all the time or, or you're not trained to uh, know how to use it properly, you could seriously injure somebody. Yes. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, ma'am. The chair's got a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. Are you, I, I'm 44, I don't, I don't dye my hair. I don't do anything. Nor do I. Did my hair, I have, a, I went to high school with a lovely gal that owns a shop in Derry. Mm -hmm. That being said, the, certainly Rite Aid and, and places like that sell numerous products that are apparently deemed acceptable for the general public to use in a safe manner. Now, certainly, you know, you have to follow the directions and there are, there are uh, potential for misuse, certainly, and there are warnings as such. But with that being said, I, you know, you, you've mentioned the mixing of chemicals and, and some of the other things that could potentially happen. Is there really a risk for, for someone to assist their spouse or assist their, their neighbor with, uh, with dyeing their hair out of a, become, on an essence, you know, from a consumer grade standpoint? I'm not familiar, well familiar with, with coloring, uh, the box coloring stuff. I know that if you, you use it incorrectly, you can cause some problems. The other, the other part is the esthetician part. Um, we've given facials and you have masks. I do a thing called a dermaplane, dermaplane facial, which is uh, in essence using a razor on a woman's face and then applying a um, uh, kind of like a mask. On, on somebody, so you're applying chemicals on their face. Uh, it's very easy to burn skin if it's not done properly. If you don't recognize that there's an issue coming, um, it, it, can, it can cause some significant injury to, to people. So it's not just about the box coloring, uh, it's about the other chemicals that are used as well. You have to be licensed to purchase those products? No, no. Um, there, are, there are places like Sally's or Per, um, 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 Paul Mitchell, that you can, you need to be a, a licensed um, professional to purchase those products. But to go to Walmart or something like that, and sometimes you don't even know what's in there, um, what's in the boxes or the or the, uh, the shampoos or things like that. Representative Allegra, does consent play a role in this at all? Uh, let me provide a little context. If uh, my brother asked me to cut his hair because he uh, couldn't get an appointment and uh, he asks me, and he's 55 years old, uh, does consent play a role in any of this? Uh, I know people that have the hobby of skydiving, which is, uh, I think, probably a little bit more dangerous than getting your hair cut but that person has consented to jumping out of an airplane with a piece of fabric on their back. I don't understand why it should be a crime for me to cut my wife's hair. Can, does consent play a role in this? That's my question. Is, is that for me representative? Yeah, sure, thank you. You know, in reality, I've seen professionals who, who don't cut hair very well. And I also have seen unlicensed people cut hair very well. Cutting hair is, is not that big a deal. It's when you start to apply chemicals uh, and you start to do, just because you give somebody a bad haircut, the joke is that the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is two weeks. Um, cutting, cutting hair is one thing. When you 
improperly use equipment and tools and you start to spread disease from one person to another, that because that person didn't recognize or understand um, that there is, a, there is an issue, that's where it becomes a problem. Hair is, hair is actually pretty disgusting and it carries diseases as well. Um, so it's not so much the, the physical act of cutting hair as it is the prevention of passing along diseases and, and conditions, infections. Follow up, please. Follow up, Representative Deliver. Under current law, cutting the hair is actually part of the problem. The, the simple act of cutting someone's hair for no remuneration is currently a crime. And uh, so uh, please address that. And, and the other side of this is, again, does consent play a role? If my kid's got a head full of nits and I take care of it, am I a criminal? If, if you, sure, I mean, and nits are one thing because they, I mean, they live off of blood. So once that happens, it's not gonna be a big deal. However, if you're cutting hair for friends, you know, consent is one thing. If I give you permission to cut my hair and you cut part of my ear, are you relieved from any uh, any liability for that? So, uh, and I've and I've had my ear cut in in, in barber school, um, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. So, if you're cutting my hair and you cause physical damage to me, does that relieve you of the liability of that act? Uh, I'm asking your question. I'm asking you: Does consent play a role in this? I, well, if my neighbor asks to cut his hair or uh, my neighbor's wife or he asked me to put a blue streak in his hair uh, <laughs> at his request, sure, should it turn me into a criminal if I, if I meet his request? And I, and I don't disagree with that. If you're, if you're going to put a blue streak in, and I asked you to put a blue streak in my hair, that's one thing. If you put a blue streak in my hair and you burn my scalp while you're doing it. That's something completely different. I didn't give you permission to hurt me. So I guess that would be the, the argument to the consent. Um, yeah, I mean, cons consent is one thing. Liability is another. As in anything else. Representative O'Brien. Thank you, and uh, thank you, sir, for taking my question. And I'm not really trying to be funny here, but I could see it. Do you see any religious ramifications to this, such as if uh, somebody belonged to a monk and it was in that cloister, uh, the terminology, if I think if my memory is right, is uh, a tonsure mm -hmm. of where you get your hair cut and certain religious sects do that. And I've always assumed, do they go to the barber or does a brother monk provide that service? And if a brother monk does provide this service by this description, would they be in any violation of their religious freedom in doing that? The the statute, and says, I do appreciate the comment on uh, by a fellow representative on that. Thank you. Um, you know, I guess technically, um, you know, the the statute says that there a person's engaged in the in the practice of barbering, cosmetology, aesthetics, uh, manicuring in a charitable, benevolent institution, nursing home, long term care facility, assisted living facility. Um, where such practice is carried on solely for the benefit of the residents of such institution. That's how we get away with doing them in a um, nursing home, a correctional facility, the hospital, those kinds of things. Um, you know, when you start to get into being in a, um, you know, convent or a monastery, I don't know if that would fit the, um, that definition. So there are exemptions, there are exemptions for not having a license to cut hair. And Representative McGuire was correct. I mean, technically, you know, your, your daughters are having a, you know, a sleepover and they're painting each other's nails and 
technically that's illegal. Is anybody going to do anything about it? No, mm -hmm. no, it's, I mean, it's common sense, but I've also seen people who are cutting hair, not for remuneration, but they're getting remuneration because they're not licensed. So they're, they're doing the services they're performing. Um, you know, they're performing services on people. And again, it's not about cutting hair. It's about the transmission and the, or the prevention of the transmission of diseases and infections. That's my biggest, that's my only gripe about this. So, so Mr. Vecchetti, so you're okay, I guess, in essence, with selective enforcement within the statute? Well, so if they're, if they're going to enforce it and they enforce it, that's one thing. Um, we have, I think, two inspectors for the whole state of New Hampshire. I know there are maybe 1,500 barbers and 15,000 cosmetologists, and I don't know how many estheticians. Um, selective enforcement is one thing. Common sense is another. Representative Schuett, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, just thinking back to the um, comments made about uh, boxed dyes that one can buy uh, in uh, various stores, um, I have to admit, I have used them myself. Uh, would you believe, Mr. Biacchetti, that those boxes always have warnings inherent in them and always recommend that someone who might use them would do a test on themselves to be sure that they don't have an allergy or a problem with the chemicals? And would you believe that most people probably ignore those warnings? I would believe that. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you, Mr. Biacchetti, for your testimony. We're going to, the chair's going to call uh, Janine Chapel. Hi, my name's Jean Chappelle, Hi. and I am the school owner member of the New Hampshire Board of Barbering, Cosmetology, and Aesthetics. Um, and we, I am representing the board today, not myself personally. Um, I want to say first that I can answer several of the questions that were asked um, by the representatives earlier in this conversation. Um, I would also like to say that we strongly oppose House Bill 606 as written. Um, no other licensed profession has exemptions for unlicensed workers to perform their activities legally just because they are not being paid. Licensing protects the public health and safety in our industry and is not intended to extend the arm of the law into someone's home where a private citizen might unclog their neighbor's drain or help someone turn a light bulb or change a fuse or cut their child's hair. There already are in place statutes, laws, and rules that allow for individuals who are licensed to go into people's homes who are homebound and take care of their hair. Um, as far as consent, I would say that consent plays a huge role in that somebody who consensually allows someone in their home to practice some form of hygiene on them is also not likely to call the police on that person to report them for performing an unlicensed activity. Please deem this bill inexpedient to legislate as written. The Board of Barbering Cosmetology and Aesthetics opposes Bill 606. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, I will then uh, close the hearing on House Bill 606. The, the testify. Thank you. I am opening the hearing on. House Bill 575 and call Representative Cordelli.
In that case, Representative Allegro, would you introduce the bill since I don't see any of the sponsors here? Sure. Um, So my name is uh, Representative Mark Allegro. I'm from uh, Grafton 7th District, covering the town of Camden. And I'm introducing, please correct me if I'm mistaken because I was filing through my bills here, HB 575, right? Uh, which is an act relative to licensure of applicants for cosmetology, aesthetics, and manicuring. Uh, if I'm reading correctly, the bill expands the use of apprenticeship programs in those fields in qualifying for licensure as a cosmetologist, manicurist, or esthetician, but for the barbering, cosmetology, and aesthetics. And Madam Chair, are there any other duties I have to do for family? You have to state whether or not you're going to take questions. Yes, and uh, clearly not qualified, but still willing to answer any questions that I may uh, from uh, the general public or from the committee. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chappelle, you, were, you signed up to speak. Would you uh, care, care to speak now? I would, thank you, Representative McGuire. Um, again, I'm Jean Chappelle. I am the school owner member of the Cosmetology Board of New Hampshire, um, and it's cosmetology, barbering, and aesthetics. Um, as far as House Bill 575 goes, in a shop apprenticeship program, it is widely accepted, as in other professions, that the instructor is a current practitioner who is continuing and working to maintain their own practice and profession for their own income. This, of course, means that the apprentice student is the second priority and is either watching or practicing alone while they are in a shop apprenticeship program, not getting undivided attention, therefore needing more time to become proficient. Also, the instructor is currently not required in the shop to be a licensed instructor. Any licensed cosmetologist, barber, or esthetician can be a, an instructor for an apprentice. That is a dangerous situation for that apprentice. We are still not opposed to the apprenticeship program. There is absolutely room for an apprenticeship program. The other um, consideration with the apprenticeship program is that it is one apprentice per practitioner, unless you are a barber, in which case you can have two apprentices. So it also actually limits the amount of um, apprentices that can be taught. Um, the instructor is currently not required in the shop to be a licensed instructor, just a practitioner. Therefore, they may not have any teaching education or experience. So again, it is more important um, to have more time with that practitioner. In a school setting, it is required that all instructors are licensed and the primary goal of every instructor is the education of the student, and that is their first priority. It is their only priority. They are not maintaining a clientele while they are teaching the students. In fact, they are prohibited from doing their own clients during school hours at the school while they are teaching. So they're pr providing undivided attention to the students, which is why the hours are reduced um, and the apprentice hours are increased. When a student is receiving uh, instruction from a licensed instructor who is not permitted to work on their own clientele, they are getting um, a different situation they, than they would get in a shop situation where they are very different and require very, very different time demands. Um, and speaking for the Board of Cosmetology, Barbering and Aesthetics, we oppose House Bill 575 for these reasons. Uh, I just want to show you something. Come in. Right, so, looking at uh, Mr. Bell, I, pre I presume you have the bill in front of you. I do. So, as I'm reading, starting in line 19, that paragraph area, where it talks about have you know completed a course of at least 600 hours, 
with the new language basically then saying which shall not exceed 600 hours, we have put that number at exactly 600 hours. Because if it cannot be at least, if it cannot be more, that, that's it, that's the number. Is, is the issue with the 600 hours as a number or is it an issue with the overall process of having uh, the apprenticeship exist with this restricted time frame? The problem is that currently um, for the, the required hours in a school for cosmetology is 1500 hours. The, the requirement for the apprenticeship program is 3000 hours as it should be. The requirement for aesthetics in a school setting is 600 hours. And the requirement for an apprenticeship in a shop is 1200 hours as it should be. Um, the, the requirement for barbering for a master barber is 1500 hours in a school setting and it is 3000 hours in a shop setting as it should be. Um, what we are opposing is the reduction of the requirement of hours for in-shop in apprentices. Does that answer your question? No. So you're saying that this bill is going to drop that from 3000 hours down to 600 hours? No, there are there are several disciplines that are um, that are managed under the board of barbering, cosmetology, and aesthetics. All of these separate disciplines have separate requirements of hours in order to complete the requirements to appeal to test for your practical exam and your practical and your written exam for your state license. Currently. Cosmetology in a school requires 1500 hours of education as it should. Currently, uh, the in-shop apprenticeship requires 3000, which it should. All the rest of the disciplines have separate hours of requirements. For example, nail technicians, if they're in a formal school setting, need to have 300 hours in a licensed school in order to appeal to get their state license through the practical exam and the written exam. In a salon setting, they need to apprentice for 600 hours because they are not, they're not in a, in a formal school setting. Thank you, Ms. Chappelle, that's very clear. Are there other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. No one else has signed up on House Bill 575. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Raise your hand if you do, no. Very good, I will close the public hearing on House Bill 575. Madam Chair, uh, if I may, I have a question of the chair. Um, Looking back at House Bill 173, which according to my notes, we exact on January 27th, um, motion by Representative Roy, seconded by Representative Goley, and we voted it ought to pass for the consent calendar, but I'm still not seeing the status of that bill showing that a report has been filled. Yes. The, mo the committee report was lost in the email for a while. I have finally seen it and it is working its way through the system. The staff has a flood right now. Thank you very much. I was afraid something like that might have happened. We have three minutes before the next hearing, so everybody stand up and stretch. Carol, can you hear me? Yes, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't had any acknowledgement of the blurb that I sent to you, Pam and Miriam, uh, a couple of nights ago. Uh, on CACR seven, oh, did sorry. you receive? I received it and passed it on. Uh, I just put in the words that you said. Insert uh, function here. 
One of the wise right, right. Okay, I, I just didn't get, hadn't had any feedback. I just wanted to make sure that uh, it hadn't gone off into cyberspace. No, I encourage the committee to assume that uh, they've written a wonderful, wonderful blurb and it has been moved on. And uh, if I if it, that's not the case, believe me, we'll be getting in touch with you. Well, I, I figured that you might well uh, contact me uh, inquiring uh, as to the status of the blurb. But again, just because ordinarily I hear something back, I, I since we have two Sorry. minutes to waste, figured I'd waste them this way. Oh, on that one. But yes, that was a fine, fine report and uh, it's working its way through the system. Terrific. Thank you. I had to answer the COVID screening questions. <clears throat> By the way, if we answer any of those in the negative, still get what? COVID? Oh, you're talking about the shot? No, no, no. This oh. is for. Oh, 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 okay. There it is. No, I'm, I'm not. It's going to charge all. I'm going to know if we're going to get a I, I'm wondering, is since since everybody is walking around and taking a break, um, does it seem to the people in the in the committee room, as it does to me, that the sound quality today is not up to what it has been recently? It seems like there's a kind of the and kind of a sharp edge to the sound, and a lot of enough background noise that it's not great. On, my, on our end, I think it's dramatically better than the last meeting. Yeah. 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 Dramatically better. Sounds the same to me. I don't know. Okay. Too bad the last time. It seems fine to me. So I don't know, Peter. Yeah, sometimes if you're doing this on your phone, you might need to move to another part of your house. I've found that to help sometimes. Or turn off the video. Your Wi Fi is marked The videos, yes, that's a lot. Yeah, if you turn the video off, which we don't get it on for voting, but otherwise, that uses up bandwidth. So if you have limited bandwidth, that'll make your sound for Exactly. And sometimes I have to turn off the Wi Fi access for my Zoom and use actual cell phone bandwidth through my, my cell provider rather than Wi Fi. So it varies. Okay. Two o'clock. Open the public hearing on House Bill 444 and call Representative Hutchins Blackstone. We all set, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Please speak. Okay. Um, I did submit my written testimony, and as I promised, I will not read it, uh, but I will go over it. So, for the record, my name is Gary Merchant. I'm a representative from Claremont, New Hampshire, Ward 2. And I'm here today to introduce House Bill 444. The intent of House Bill 444 is to make some technical changes to the RSA 318, which governs the pharmacist and pharmacies. So in sequence, the first one I'd like to talk to the committee about is compounding. For those who've been on this committee for a few terms, you may go back and Remember that there was some, dis some concern about the pharmacy board with inspecting physicians' offices related to compounding. The challenge the board faced at that time and still does is the fact that compounding in the law requires the board to comply with USP standards, not to utilize the standards. But the time in which the board was looking at physician offices, the board was not allowed to use the FDA standard, which was drug preparation, which is the final stage of preparing a drug to a patient through the manufacturing process. And because of that conflict, the board had no choice but to sort of enforce a law that it really didn't believe in, but unfortunately the law required it. So what I'm trying to simply do today with change in the language is to allow some flexibility for the board to use the standards or any other standards that they feel are applicable to the world of compounding without getting into a situation where they blindly follow national standards 
that the board may not believe um, is appropriate for the state of New Hampshire nor for its citizens. And this is coming from my 10 years on the board, serving the last two years as the president. So that's the first one with compounding is just simply taking the word shall and saying they may utilize the standards. On to the next one is the word of inspecting of pharmacies. I'd like to leave that one, if I may, Madam Chair, towards the end. I think that's the more challenging one. In regards to the word of labeling the prescription, the days in which a pharmacist was the sole person behind the prescription counter in which they received the prescription, filled the prescription, wrote the prescription, typed the label and everything else, there was really one person in the pharmacy doing the work and that was the pharmacist. A, comp a lot of times they may have help from, um, at that time, support staff, they weren't technicians per se. What's happened over the course of time is that the prescription filling process has now been broken into various steps. So you have the intake of the prescription, which is I believe the most critical, is for the pharmacist to review that prescription and make the determination whether they should fill it or not. So therefore we created the licensed technician last time to allow the technician to do the product verification to do the final stages with the technical side of filling a prescription. So I think it's more appropriate to include the initials of the pharmacist that actually reviewed the prescription, who approved the prescription, than a person who may be on somewhere in that chain of events to say, that's the person that the patient's looking for or anyone else. Um, and definitely using the pharmacist in charge initials doesn't tie it back to the actual prescription. So what I'm trying to suggest in the bill is to allow for the board to require the initials of the pharmacist who did the review process. If you go back and look at collaborative practice, the challenge with collaborative practice, or one of the challenges, and it became very evident today with telehealth, to require a patient to sign an agreement between a pharmacist and a provider means that they have to review the agreement, understand the agreement, and assign consent to the agreement. We do not in any other part of medical community that I know of require a patient to sign a document like that. We don't ask them to sign and review the document between <clears throat> a physician and the PA. We don't ask them to assign a referral to go to physical therapy or go to a lab. So what I'm asking for here is to not require the patient to sign the agreement. They still have to give their consent because ultimately if they decide to go for the referral or not, that's their choice. And then number two, the word attending is problematic. It's ambigu it's, it provides a level of ambiguity. And what I'm trying to get to there is that when you talk about attending, <clears throat> is it the primary care phys physician or is it the doc who's taking care of a particular disease state. Today, most patients go to multiple physicians, multiple providers. If you have a cardiologist, you have a rheumatologist, you have a orthopedic surgeon and so forth, you may be under their care, but you're not their primary care. So by deleting the word attending and making it more broad, dealing with the patient's practitioner, it allows for each practitioner the patient sees to enter into a collaborative agreement with a pharmacist. So that's the intent between those two changes. One is, not to require the patient to sign the document and to leak the word attending in order to broaden the scope to allow patients who see multiple physicians to have multiple agreements with providers. In regards to permits and fees, that's something we talked about last time when this was before the committee, which I sat on. Um, by the way, it's good to see everybody all again, even though it's virtual. Um, but what happens is that we have a situation now in pharmacy. The roots of pharmacy was you had an independent pharmacy and it was owned by a pharmacist. And the pharmacist and the owner were basically one and the same. Those days are gone. Most pharmacies today are owned by corporate America and the pharmacist is still responsible and accountable to the board of pharmacy for compliance to all the rules and regulations. However, that person no longer owns the pharmacy and therefore does not have a lot of control over the resources 
to operate that pharmacy and to operate it safely. So what I'm advocating for in the bill and suggesting to this committee is that we level the playing field and say both parties have responsibility to the board, both the pharmacists in charge, as well as to the owner. The owner is responsible to be sure that the appropriate resources are provided to the pharmacist in charge and the pharmacist in, ch in charge is responsible to use those resources appropriately. So it's a joint responsibility, equally accountable to both. So that's why the change in the permit fees and the language with the pharmacist in charge that we actually have the pharmacist in charge and the permit holder equally accountable. The last one is the inspections. Um, after we talked about that last year, and again, in House Bill, it was 1655, 35, the committee agreed that this was something to talk about for future legislation. What I am recommending to the committee, based upon experience on the board, that we still allow the Board of Pharmacy, who has the expertise, to write the rules and regulations on how drugs are stored, how they're handled, how they're disposed of, and so forth. That's their expertise. They go into a non-pharmacy provider's office, a dental, veterinary, whatever it may be. The difference is here, if they find an infraction, the board does not act on that infraction. The board then takes the investigation or the results of the uh, inspection, sends it over to the appropriate licensing board, they are the ones responsible, if they want to, to entertain how they want to impose any discipline onto their licensee. The Board of Pharmacy has no jurisdiction over that licensee. Um, it strictly goes back to the licensing board for them to review and then determine what they want to do with the information. All the board is doing is doing the inspections on their behalf and then providing the documentation back to the respective licensing board for them to look at and review and act on, not the Board of Pharmacy. So those are the five things I'm proposing to this committee on House Bill 444, and I'll open it up to questions. I have a question, Madam Chair. Yes, I see. Representative Schmidt. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I don't have my camera on it right at the moment, Gary, but uh, I'm looking at the text of the bill. Uh, look at line four. Okay, you got it. I have it. Okay, do you see that it doesn't? It doesn't seem to work in English. Uh, line three ends with the word specific. Then you pick up uh, agreement between a pharmacist, and then it says an close parentheses and an and that doesn't work in English. <laughs> I Thank think Representative Smith, I would say I'm going to send you down to OLS to help them out. Well, you're the one that needs to have the language say what you want it to say. I hear you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that that that's just part of it. Um, Follow so, up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so you um, you <laughs> mentioned the, the words at some point. I'm not finding it right at the moment. With the word "may" instead of "shall." Well, in the language, last year I proposed to have a May and leave the um, inspections, if you will, go into the Board of Pharmacy. And I'm proposing that the board still has the authority to go in, which is the shell. But if they find anything with the inspection, it goes over to the respective licensing board. That's the change. So I don't know why. Well, <clears throat> I saw it earlier when I, when I read the bill, um, but it said shall be subject to you um and in that shell was struck and was may be subject to i'm not finding it in the te in the bill text at the moment i am looking at hb 4444 uh and somehow i'm not finding it but in any case uh may be sub subject to shall be subject to seems to me to, that, that there's no real difference between may be subject to and shall be subject to frankly but um um so think about that. I'm not sure that I want to strike shall uh, and substitute may for in when in the phrase shall be subject to or may be subject to. I want to think about that further, bounce it off of you. Um, 
but then my, my uh, sec second question is with regard to uh, whether you have any opposition to your proposed language from the board or anyone else. The, the Board of Pharmacy is in full support of it. Um, I did run this by them uh, to ensure that I wasn't running afoul of the intent of the board or the desire of the board. So the board did vote on this bill and did approve it. Uh -huh, thank you. Uh, fellows. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Merchant, I maybe I heard incorrectly. I thought when you were talking about the labeling mm -hmm. that you said you wanted to have the initials of the person who checked the prescription on the label. Is that what you said? It wasn't my intent if I said it. Um, oh. What it was trying to communicate was that the person who reviews the prescription when it comes in, it makes the determination to have the prescription filled. You want so, their initials on it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Representative Fellows. I, I don't see where it says that. Can you point that out? Hold on. Actually, it doesn't. You're right. So no. also, I can't find that may and shall thing either. Yes, where the question about the prescription label is on line, starting on line 13 on page two, and it doesn't require the name or, name or initials of any pharmacist as amended. So, Representative Merchant, if you if that's what you intend, would you uh, please review the language and make sure it says that? I will definitely thank you for picking that up, Ms. Uh, Representative Fellows. Um, I definitely see that that was left out of the bill, so my apologies to the committee for leaving it out. I will definitely go back to OLS and get a, an amendment, or I, I can't, but the committee. Oh. I can work with somebody on the committee if you'd like. I don't know who would, that would be to an amendment, or I can make an amendment and have it sent to somebody on the committee because it's now the committee's bill. I'll, I'll take it if, if you want. Thank you, Representative Fellows. Representative uh, Fellows, uh, you can find the May if it's there. I don't see it either. Representative Broda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Merchant, you have made a comment about changing the attendant physician to yes. practitioner. The attending physician I'm interpreting to be the primary care physician. Is that correct? That's where the ambiguity lies because the way it's written, if you look at the definitions in RSA 318, it says the one with primary responsibility for um, the therapy. So it's kind of, I get the actual language for you, Representative Brody. Um, it does open up a level of ambiguity and that's been a concern both by the Board of Pharmacy and by um, providers and pharmacists and trying to understand who can actually get into an agreement, if you will. So to avoid the ambiguity, my recommendation is to strike the word attending, which implies primary care um, versus looking at the person who's responsible for the disease management, whether it be diabetes and cardiology. Follow up, please. I guess I'm going to be allowed a follow up question. So, I guess I'm my concern is, is, is where is it addressed that subscription prescriptions by a specialist are um, tied into the primary care's record for that patient? So let's say a cardiologist recommends a medication, mm -hmm. and the primary care physician recognizes that this might be a problem for that person based on another specialist that he's going to, Correct. or they're going to. How does that work with all this? Or is this not, or is this not the place to address that? I believe, Representative Broda, it is not actually the role of the pharmacist, it's, it, except that the, the pharmacist is trained to look for interactions, mm -hmm. but, the, but the actual transfer of information between specialists and primary care physicians is the responsibility of the doctors. Thank you. Representative Lekas. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, 
I have a question about the uh, differences in the standards uh, that the board thinks are right and uh, must be necessary. In general, tendency that um, USP standards are too strict, not strict enough, or just wrong. I was curious about that. Maybe an example of one. Help. Well, I think the one is representative. Which one speaking, please? Uh, Marcus. Okay, Representative, I'd give you an example back to the compounding issue that we talked about before, where the board um, went in to do inspections and had to utilize the USB standards. Um, there are times at which we go into a provider's office and many times the inspector does more education than inspecting. Um, so it's one of those things where we're trying to thread the needle between having regulations on how we store things and be consistent about that throughout the state and then to inspect against those standards. But when we find an infraction or find something that doesn't meet the standards that falls below the standard, that that is then report to licensing board. An example could be, um, this is back to the federal government. If you have controlled drugs every two years, you're supposed to do an inventory on May 1st, was, we changed now to do it once a year, but the federal government requires that each practitioner do a count. So in that case, when we go into the provider's office and try to help them, we find out that the inventory has not been done according to federal law. What we did in the past was the board would issue a fine. What this bill does is say, okay, when the board finds that, that fine is not levied by the board. That information goes back to the Board of Medicine, the Board of Dentistry, whatever it may be, and for them to make the determination if there should be a fine for that infraction. Representative O'Brien. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank uh, first Representative Fellows. I did have that same question with the labeling, but uh, Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. On um, lines four and five on page one, uh, you seem to have struck out the patient or patient's authorized representative. Uh, does that include somebody that has a medical proxy, like in the case of an elderly patient or somebody that is uh, mentally or physically incapacitated? Uh, that person who has that proxy cannot... Uh, you know, interject on the uh, patient's behalf? Thank you for the question, Representative O'Brien. Uh, no, it's actually the other way. Instead of requiring either the patient or the patient's authorized caregiver to sign the form, which is difficult with telehealth, they can give their verbal consent and not have to be given a written consent. Okay. okay. Are there other questions for Representative Merchant? Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, it's, I know you can't necessarily see me, but it is good to see you, uh, my old friend. Uh, I have a question in reference to, you said when you were talking about national standards and using a state standard uh, maybe I'm a little confused. I, I thought you said that there was there would be circumstances where the national standard would not be followed, but the state standard would. Did I hear you right, or am I confused? Um, obviously, I didn't say it clearly. So thank you, Representative Pearson. It's good to see you as well, um, although I, it's good to hear you. I guess I can't see you. Um, in saying that, what I'm trying to do with the change is to allow the Board of Pharmacy the, some flexibility where they can use the federal standards when it makes sense and it doesn't have a conflict with state standards. Um, to allow the board to set state standards based upon federal standards but not require them to follow them blindly. The issue that we ran into was that the FDA standard, which is also a federal standard, the board could not utilize in the word in the definition of compounding because it's not part of the USB standard. So we had two federal agencies with different standards that conflicted with each other. 
and it created a problem for the board because the board was bound to follow the USP standards for the law and could not entertain the FDA federal standards um, that would also have eliminated the problem. Thank you. Okay, so the the state in my okay my my experience is you as you know from another another world mostly in the fire code where, where we don't necessarily we have state adopted national standards and there is no overlying national standard. So it, it so just keep that in mind as this is my frame of reference. So here the state standard that you're talking about has to be an equivalency or greater than the national standard. It cannot be less or reduced from what, what a national standard is, right? Today, that's correct. However, when we impose on a board or anyone else in our state, a national standard the state has no control over or any influence over, then we don't have any flexibility within the state to make a determination that that particular standard doesn't fit the needs of our citizens here in New Hampshire. Thank you. So, so Representative Merchant, you were, you were on this committee prior um, and you're aware that is a glowing example, the state of New Hampshire adopts a fire code to which we carve out certain things that the state of New Hampshire deems potentially problematic for whatever reason. Why would the pharmacy board not operate in a similar manner where you would adopt, say, the USP standards with the exception of X, Y, and Z to fit what's going on in New Hampshire? Thank you for that question, Representative Pearson. I think if we start carving, we could carve things out of the USP standards. Um, so we can say these are exceptions that the board doesn't have to follow or has to take and determine whether they should apply or not. I mean, that's another approach to it. Um, what I'm suggesting is that instead of trying to get into a list of all the things that the board thinks is problematic, um, I would suggest that we say the board can adopt the standards based upon the needs of the board and what the citizens of the state need. The challenge we have here is that at the federal level, for instance, we had two standards and they were in conflict with each other. So if we have and state agency only following one standard, it doesn't have the option to look at the other agency at the federal level and look at their standards because they're not allowed to. Do I understand you correctly to say that the, where, well, where does the state adopt the USP or does it? If you look into the compounding, and you look onto the bill on line 23, all so, compounding should be done in compliance with USB standards. Okay, so did the Board of Pharmacy at some point actually adopt the USP? Yes, they did. And that's what caused the heartburn, uh, Madam Chair, because when we looked at the compounding being done in physicians' offices, the things that we're doing with Remicade specifically, the way they were compounding it and still do today violates USB standards, but not FDA standards. Lovely, absolutely lovely. So what I'm suggesting to the committee is to allow the board some flexibility that when there are conflicts at the federal level and conflict within standards is the board has some flexibility about which way to go with the standards, not getting in the same situation we had last time. I think this needs more work, but not necessarily in the context of this bill. But this that sounds like a invitation to disaster. That we uh -huh. have multiple federal standards that apply that don't necessarily agree with each other. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's kind of the, the intent of the bill to try to get some flexibility to it and avoid things we've had done. Or the bridges we crossed in the past that caused some heartburn. Okay. I, I can see that you're dealing with one specific issue, but the USP is a fairly substantial code, and I and I would imagine there are other cases where it conflicts with other 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 federal departments. Great. Madam Chair, yes, there are other areas, but you're right; it's not a time for the committee to address it in this bill. 
I want some Brota. Representative um, Merchant, did we not address this compounding issue last year? I mean, I, I seem to remember a bill about compounding in the pharmaceutical board. I thought we, we, had, we had already, and the, and the USP and the conflict, I thought we'd already fixed that. Representative Broder, that bill was retained and therefore couldn't, uh, it was held for interim study because of issues not necessarily this one. Okay, follow up then. Is this, do these, does this, does this bill run tandem to the other one? Is it, is it in conflict or is it a advanced version of the other one? It's advanced version. Okay, thank you. All right, Representative Schmidt, you have another question? I do, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, uh, so, I see that there is a uh, submission by uh, Dr. Conway, I believe. Is he listed to speak to us? Uh, yes, okay. he will speak to us, but he can't today. He has a conflict. Uh, he, he, did I hear you say he's not going to speak because he has a conflict? He has an emergency. He was signed up to speak, but he will not be able to. Th thank you. That's it. I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Uh, so as, as you may know, Representative Merchant, uh, Dr. Conway has uh, filed uh, a uh, thing with the committee in, in uh, opposition uh, to uh, some aspects anyway of your bill. Are you familiar with his, uh, with his letter? Representative Smith, yes, I am. <clears throat> I think the intent of what he's asking for is for the Board of Pharmacy to not have any authority to go into a provider's office to do inspections. Um, I do have a concern about that because the reason why we started doing inspections in the first place many years ago was because the boards of pharmacy, nursing, dental, and so forth came to the Board of Pharmacy asking for us to do inspections through an MOU. So that's kind of the root of all of this is that the respective boards recognized the pharmacy had the expertise, had the inspectors, and asked the Board of Pharmacy to do the inspections on their behalf. It then evolved into <clears throat> no longer having an MOU for many different reasons, a lot of it dealing with fun funding mechanisms, and that's what got us here today. So you know you are you are aware that there yes. you recall, of course, and now you're aware of it. You recall that there was a big flap when uh, pharmacy board inspectors went into doctor's offices and I think kind of like shut them, some of them were shut, uh, shut down pursuant to the inspectors, uh, you know, reaction to things they found. Uh, there was a major flap between you guys and the, and the docs about that. Uh, is, this oh, a that is this a continuation of that? It's trying to resolve that issue um, so that, instead of the Board of Pharmacy having jurisdiction over their providers when they find an infraction, what they're doing is taking the documentation and turning it over to the respective licensing board for them to act on. Madam Chair, are we gonna see, see somebody, hear somebody from the medical side uh, in, in Dr. Is place? I'm called, queued up and ready to speak as soon as you stop asking questions. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Shut me up, okay. Possible. Yes. I'd like to call Nancy Wilson, please. Uh, you should just uh, unmute yourself, Ms. Wilson. Ms. Wilson? She just showed up on our um, deck. So here she is. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Thank you for, for okay. just uh, Let me uh, show you who I am. Good. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the House Executive Departments and Administration Committee. My name is Nancy Wilson and I am speaking for the New Hampshire Nurse Practitioners Association of which I am a member. The Nur New Hampshire Nurse Practitioner Association is the professional association in the state dedicated to serving as the voice for nurse practitioners. We wish to register our opposition to HB 444 as introduced. The bill appears to be a rewrite of sections of 2020's HB 1536, which your committee considered and sent to interim study on a 19 to zero vote less than a year ago. The committee report to the House said that multiple professions had come out in opposition to HB 1536 and that interim study was needed, quote, to clarify definitions and resolve some of the interprofessional disputes, unquote. But work on HB 1536 was curtailed by the pandemic. And to our knowledge, those outstanding questions have not been answered or resolved. Our association opposed the 2020 bill. The primary issues we identified for nurse practitioners were the definition of quote, dispensing, unquote, as well as the vague language in the disciplinary section of HB 1536. While HB 444 includes no definition of quote, dispensing, unquote, we have the same problems with its disciplinary section that we did with HB 1536. For these reasons, we think the timing of HB 444 is premature until a study is completed. An alternative for the committee to consider is an amendment being offered by the New Hampshire Medical Society, which would address the bill's attempt to give the Board of Pharmacy too much authority over other practitioners, including advanced registered nurse practitioners. An example is the Board's of, nurse, of Pharmacy's ability to inspect a nurse's, quote, aseptic technique, unquote, in non-hospital settings. We see this as an overreach of that board and both duplicative and unnecessary when nurse practitioners are governed by RSA 326-B and licensed by the Board of Nursing. We urge the committee to either retain or amend HB 444, but not to adopt it as introduced. Thank you for taking my testimony. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Ms. Wilson. Thank you for being here today. As you know, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure anymore whether you were on the uh, in attendance when the subcommittee that I was on worked on this compounding uh, and dispensing issue several years ago, uh, I would say about three or four years ago. Were you part of that gang? No, that not. gang? No, I was not. Okay, so so uh, I, let me turn on my light so you can see me a little bit better. Um, so uh, as you know, at the time, uh, there was a, a, a definite need for uh, for nurses Basically, that was how it was being done, as I understood it, for nurses to travel out to uh, to the homes of people who are uh, were because of age or infirmity unable to uh, to go into uh, one of these uh, centers, such as there is uh, very close to the Portsmouth Regional Hospital. They have a it's called infusion a fusion center, I think. Okay, you familiar with that? I'm a few, I'm uh, familiar with that service, yes. 
that service. Okay. So you know that uh, you know, that, that people go in and get their infusions done there. But there are people who are, as I say, by virtue of their infirmity or age or combination thereof, unable to to go to such a center and they need to be cared for at home. Uh, and especially trained nurses are going out to these homes. Uh, and there the question becomes, can they get a sterile uh, setup uh, so that they can combine the, uh, the, the... Excuse me, Reverend Schmidt, I muted you. Your question is interesting, but it is totally irrelevant to this bill. There is nothing about infusion or safe handling anywhere. The inspection of users talks about storage, handling, labeling, distribution, and disposal. It does not talk about aseptic technique. It does not talk about infusion. All of that process has been completely removed from this bill. So please ask the question that's relevant to the bill in front of us and not to the bill from last year. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Well, I appreciate uh, your, uh, your pointing this out, but the reason I, I give all this is because Ms. Wilson said she was not part of that uh, working group that tried to straighten that situation out. And so I'm wondering whether we are going to see something where the, the nurses and the pharmacy board are going to be on the same page because we should not be uh, playing Solomon here so are, what, what can you tell me with regard to the, any attempt by your organization to reach a meeting of the minds with the pharmacists on this issue? Well, uh, I, I maintain that uh, as representative of the association, we maintain that um, each board is responsible for um, Making sure that uh, the rules are in place, the people that they're the uh, people who are licensed by that board uh, are uh, competent and are following the rules. And uh, I, uh, as far as uh, I mean, collaboration is fine, but um, as far as inspecting, uh, I I do believe that um, it's important for. Uh, each board to take care of, of that internally. Thank you. Uh, follow up. From Ms. Wilson? Yes. Dr. Schmidt, follow up? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, but the point is that uh, respecting the competence of you and your organization, uh, this is this is something that needs to be resolved and so that's my question is, what is being done to reach a meeting of the minds so that we have a collaboration of two, uh, two separate entities, uh, both of which are highly trained uh, and somewhat turf sensitive, I understand, but we, we, we got to get a resolution of this. And just putting it off is not, it's not in the best interest of the citizens of New Hampshire. So where are we going with this? Uh, I, I understand your concern, but uh, again, we are we are governed by RSA 326-B, uh, which gives us our scope of practice. Uh, each level of nursing has this in place, and uh, our licensure is um, is well governed by the Board of Nursing. And I would say that for the other disciplines as well. So I, 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 I think the question is, is moot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Not seeing any other questions, but I'd like to call Helen Provanas. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Helen Provanas and I am representing the New Hampshire Board of Pharmacy. I am the current president of the New Hampshire Board of Pharmacy 
And we are in favor of House Bill 444, which has been uh, sponsored by Representative Merchant and um, Massimilla. So this bill serves to clarify and further define some existing statutes pertinent to the practice of pharmacy. And I just wanna take just a few moments to comment on some of these changes. Uh, regarding the collaborative practice agreements, the statute was simplified to read um, an agreement between the pharmacist and the patient's practitioner and not requiring the um, patient sign the agreement, but obviously the patient give consent to care. So just to give you a little bit of background about um, how a collaborative practice agreement works. Um, for example, uh, we have several pharmacists and physicians that have collaborative collaborative practice agreements around anticoagulant therapy. So for example, a patient would come into the pharmacy, they would get their lab work done, a level would be um, attained, and based on that level and based on what the physician would like the Coumadin levels to be adjusted by, that's what that, that pharmacist would do. So that's kind of an example of like a simple collaborative practice agreement around a um, anticoagulant type of a, of a clinic setting. Um, regarding inspection and regulation of certain uses of prescription drugs, again, additional verbiage was added there to adopt and enforce standards to promote safe handling, storage, labeling, distribution, and disposal of prescriptions, and to also report any infractions, again, to those responsible agencies or licensing boards. So there's nothing there. Um, um, to, you know, talk about, as Ms. Wilson said, about aseptic technique. So there isn't anything there around that. And again, it, it really is all about promoting patient safety. Um, the, you know, the inspectors go in and, you know, take a thorough look as far as, you know, the standards that, that should be met when, you um, you know, anything that around medications, right, is, is involved. And, Bringing that then to the attention of that of their of their own boards, um, we feel is appropriate. And again, as Representative mentioned, um, you know I've been in the board for nine years now, and you know back in the day we we were asked to do this by all of the all of the medical boards. They they wanted our assistance because they didn't have the capability and um, the people available to do these inspections for them. So they actually, you know, asked us to do this. Regarding the pharmacy permits, again, additional verbiage was added there to include the permit holder and pharmacist in charge to have joint and equal responsibility. We really feel that this is very, very important. Um, there are instances where there are certain things that are found upon inspection in the pharmacy where the pharmacist in charge maybe is, you know, trying to get it fixed. Like, for example, the refrigerator isn't at the right temperature and they have reached out to possibly their permit holder, their corporate, their manager, and they are still not able to get those those changes. They are not able to get a new refrigerator or get it fixed. And so in the so the way the rules stand now, or the statute stands now, the responsibility is the pharmacist in charge, and the pharmacist in charge is then receiving that disciplinary action when, in fact, their hands are tied and they really can't can't do as much as um, as they're able to. So that's why that verbiage was added there, and um, and yeah, and I, again, I I, I do want to say that the uh, board of pharmacy again, fully supports this bill and the um, RSA amendments. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to provide testimony today. I also provided everybody with written testimony to support what I'm saying today. And I would be um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, are there questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes, you are. Okay, and let me just turn on my video. There we are. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to the, to the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Auerbach. I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Dental Society. The NHDS is opposed to HB 444. The NHDS is a statewide organization representing over 1,100 members of the dental profession, including dentists, dental hygienists, dental assistants, and practice managers, all of whom operate in accordance with the laws and rules of the Dental Practice Act as administered by the Board of Dental Examiners. If a violation of these laws or rules occurs, the BODE launches a thorough investigation of the charges, including, if necessary, an on-site inspection. If disciplinary action is warranted, the accused is given a fair and reasonable hearing conducted by the board, consisting of dentists, hygienists, and others whose expertise in dentistry is brought to bear. Furthermore, any dentist who prescribes medications for patients must maintain an active DEA license, the requirements for which are updated continuing education training on the safe storage, handling, labeling, distribution, and disposal of prescription drugs. The DEA may, if warranted, conduct inspections and initiate disciplinary actions for noncompliance. In fact, in light of the opioid crisis several years ago, it was made mandatory that all dentists, as a condition of New Hampshire state licensure, undergo biennial continuing education on opioids and other prescription drugs. Lastly, NHDS and the American Dental Association have in place a number of relevant parameters, such as our uh, Council on Ethics and Council on Peer Review, which provide another layer of oversight on a wide range of issues, including pre prescription protocols. It is the belief of the New Hampshire Dental Society that HB 444 creates an unnecessary additional layer of oversight one that is separate and disconnected from the primary licensing board for dentistry in New Hampshire. Our concern is that this bill was developed without the consultation of the Board of Dental Examiners or any of the other licensing boards under the OPLC. We're also deeply concerned that the Board of Pharmacy's relative lack of familiarity with dentistry may foster unwarranted inspections that cause confusion and fear among patients. We understand that an amendment has been offered that would, be, that would exempt dentists from section two of this bill. The NHDS is in favor of such an amendment. However, with regard to the original bill, we believe that it will negatively impact dental practices across the state. We therefore request that you vote this legislation inexpedient to legislate. And as always, the New Hampshire Dental Society is happy to provide any information and resources that this committee may need to make an informed decision. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Auerbach. Do I take your comments to mean that you object to section two of the bill on inspections and you don't care about the rest? Our biggest concern right now is the, uh, is the addition of additional inspections and so an oversight over the board of dental examiners and the dentists themselves. So section two is specific to that. Um, as I said, I would be in support of the amendment striking dentists from that section, uh, but I, I, we, we're all concerned about the additional layers of oversight. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Auerbach? None. Thank you very much. Thank you. James Potter. Good afternoon, and thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Jim Potter, and I serve as Executive Vice President for the New Hampshire Medical Society. Um, as noted earlier, Dr. David Conway, who is President of the New Hampshire Board of Medicine, was not able to testify due to an emergency procedure. Uh, however, uh, uh, through uh, Mike Padmore, you have received an email of his written testimony. Uh, and for the record, uh, the Board of Medicine did vote against this provision um, last year and again this year. Um, the Medical Society is again strongly opposing the language in Section 2 of House Bill 444 that would strengthen the Board of Pharmacy's ability to inspect and will other uh, licensed providers from other boards. Um, so we have sent uh, you all, hopefully you've received at a proposed amendment. Uh, on this proposed amendment, um, this has been endorsed by the New Hampshire Medical Society, the New Hampshire Board of Medicine, the New Hampshire's Nurses Association, the New Hampshire's New Hampshire Nurse Practitioner Association, the New Hampshire Veterinary Medicine Association, and the New Hampshire Dental Society. Specifically to that end, um, 
beginning on line eight of House Bill 444, we would ask to strike the words going to line nine, physicians, veterinarians, dentists, advanced registered nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and uh, from the bill. Um, I did hear your other uh, uh, discussion about shall versus may, and if uh, those practitioners are struck, it, it doesn't matter to us, although we have suggested the, the word may rather than shall. Also in our amendment, we would add a new section, new section three, um, that is uh, references uh, 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 section 318.9-A, inspection services. This, this actually was part of HB 1536 uh, last year. And what it says is that the Board of Pharmacy, then we, we strike shall and add may, provide inspectional services under the chapter of RSNA 18, 318 B25 to the Board of Medicine, the Board of Veterinary Medicine, the Board of Podiatry, the Board of Registration for in, optimo, in um, Optometry, the Board of Dental Examiners, the Board of Nursing, and the Naturopathic Board of Examiners. And it would add the words or other health profession licensing boards upon the request of the respective board. So again, it's very clear, um, enough is enough. This has been happening for years, for the last five years. Um, uh, and essentially we're asking that these professions be removed from any implicit, implied authority uh, from the Board of Pharmacy. Um, it also clarifies that the New Hampshire Healthcare Professional Boards retain the authority of the respective licensees to request such inspection services of the Board of Pharmacy. And we believe firmly that's the way it should be, not the other way around. Now, normally we would ask you just to ITL this bill, but because of beha repeated behaviors um, of, of stemming from the Board of Pharmacy over the last uh, five years, enough is enough. All five professional groups are requesting to be removed from inspections and to clear and clarify that the respective licensees boards have clear jurisdiction are able to request such inspection services if warranted. Further, um, I think it's been misrepresented on the MOUs. In fact, the Board of Medicine last year rejected an MOU that was put forward by the Board of Pharmacy to accomplish this same end. It is my understanding that the Board of Nursing also rejected a similar MOU by the Board of Pharmacy. So as last year, you are in clear record that both these boards want nothing to do with the Board of Pharmacy inspecting their licensees, not the other way around as has been characterized today. Second, this past year, the executive director of the Board of Pharmacy was terminated due to high uh, irregular activities and practices that stem from many of the happenings that we're talking about today and date back a few years. Third, not once, but twice, Attempted rules by the Board of Pharmacy have been thwarted. Uh, one could say by the lack of authority, but again, we didn't think they were appropriate um, and they were opposed by many boards um, and practitioners. And fourth, as was referred to earlier, uh, it troubled me to hear um, the author say that uh, Remicade uh, uh, is, uh, is compounded. Remicade is not compounded, it is mixed. And that was the clear intent of Senate Bill 581 that was passed by the General, uh, general Court um, that essentially restricted the Board of Pharmacy's authority over compounding and clarified that infusion products are not compounded in that way has been described. All right, this was stemming from the previous year when the Board of Pharmacy went and uh, inspected and fined 12 inspection fusion therapy practices um, and clinics. Also, I'm very troubled by Section 3 compounding standards of House Bill 444 that would give the Board of Pharmacy the ability to interpret and issue rules on national compounding standards. Given its more checkered history of infusion therapy services, we would urge the committee not to make any changes to the Board of Pharmacy's authority to develop new rules over prescription drugs until the OPLC's legislative budget uh, assistant LBA audit is conducted. I've been told that this LBA audit is scheduled for later this spring and will be 
and be focusing on the questionable practices of the Board of Pharmacy over the last five years. Again, we're highly troubled. I will speak to one area outside of section two uh, that was described. Attending does not imply being a PCP or a specialist. In fact, attending refers to the patient. It is the attending physician to the patient, not the type of practice. So again, to clarify that dialogue, I, I don't think that was correct and, and where that was headed. Again, uh, we're very concerned because we think this is being used to, uh, for coercive inspections to disrupt the marketplace, sending patients to much more expensive settings. And for that, we oppose um, the, the bill as presented, um, and ask that you adopt uh, our proposed amendment. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Thank you. Can you answer questions? Representative Shewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Potter. You mentioned that um, you would prefer that the various boards could request, or uh, say practitioners under the boards, could request an inspection from the Board of Pharmacy. Could you give us an example of, for example, when a physician's office would request an inspection by the Board of Pharmacy? Uh, right, well, let me clarify. It would actually be the, the respective boards of the licensing. So it wouldn't be necessarily an office practice. Appointment. It would be a board who would hand a particular case and said, well, we'd like a, a little bit more expertise of a uh, inspector who has background in pharmacy. Um, and the way that the uh, OPLC is reorganizing its inspectors is actually not to a specific board, but their intent is to have that you have a group of inspectors that have various expertises. I think that's where we've gotten in troubles before is that certain boards have said, oh, these are inspectors and we gotta keep them busy. And so we're gonna go forward. So in this case, the intent of the amendment is really to say that if the board is presented with a case or complaint, and says, we need a little bit more expertise in this specific case, we can ask the Board of Pharmacy or that, that actually it will be the Board of Pharmacy's inspector or who has that, that expertise to come in and to do a further inspection. Um, excuse me, follow up? Follow up. So um, a request for someone with further expertise for inspection would simply be based on a complaint that that board had received. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, not necessarily. Um, boards investigate various practices, uh, do trends. It can uh, emanate from a complaint, but the disciplinary uh, practices are not limited to uh, those kind of activities. So uh, no, it's not based strictly on a complaint to answer your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no further question. Thank you. Are there other questions for Mr. Potter? Seeing none, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House Bill 444? Seeing none. Public hearing. And Open the public hearing on our last bill, House Bill 405. I don't see the sponsor. So, yep. So, Representative Blackness, would you introduce this bill? And we'll yes, uh, Madam Chair. So, this I'm introducing House Bill 405 relative to out of state applicant uh, occupation, occupation licensing for. Certification. Uh, I really don't. I, I've read through this, but I don't have a lot of uh, familiarity, so I really can't answer questions. Thank you very much. Um, the only other, the only person who was signed up to speak is Mr. Ross Connolly. So Hi, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, fine. Great. Well, thank you for having me uh, today. And 
Thank you to the members of the committee for holding this hearing. Uh, for the record, my name is Ross Connolly. I'm the Deputy State Director for Americans for Prosperity in New Hampshire. And on behalf of the thousands of AFP activists across the state, I urge you to support HB 405. Uh, while AFP believes the most effective form of recognition is to remove unnecessary uh, government licensing requirements within New Hampshire, so that formal recognition would not be required in many instances. This bill would at least give relief for many looking to move to New Hampshire and work within a licensed field. This licensing recognition bill would reduce, uh, reduce barriers to dozens of occupations between New Hampshire and the rest of the country, ultimately, ultimately making New Hampshire a leader in removing interstate licensing barriers. Many low income licensed professions have standards and requirements that vary drastically across states. We found this was the case for healthcare workers when the state had to quickly increase the available capacity in the healthcare sector during the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Governor Sununu quickly provided universal recognition uh, for all healthcare sector licensed workers. So you may ask who, who would benefit from this bill uh, looking across licensed fields, uh, low income professions across New England, there are more than a dozen examples of license requirements that are more onerous than New Hampshire and should be automatically recognized. For example, in Rhode Island, which is one of the most onerously licensed states in the nation, uh, the, the license requirement for being a shampooer is 1500 hours and in Massachusetts, it's a thousand hours, which is the same as the license requirement to be a barber in New Hampshire. And here uh, we require a fraction of the time for shampooers requiring 150 hours. Another example, if you are an optician in Massachusetts, you are required to have two years of formal education, pass three exams for a total of an estimated 730 day lost days to acquire the license. In New Hampshire, we require a $110 fee and to pass an exam. The hoops associated with quickly transferring your optician license have been waived via emergency order number 39, but that's only temporary. New Hampshire should codify this recognition and statute by passing HB 405. And this disparity even exists when it comes to already widely standardized licenses. We are in the midst of a severe housing shortage. Electricians are desperately needed. Uh, the National Electrical Re Reciprocal Alliance, uh, which New Hampshire joined in 2005, only applies to 10 states in our bordering states of Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts. Many of these highly burdensome states, which also have uh, the, the highest outbound, outbound migration, are not included in our reciprocity. So New York, Rhode Island, California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey are just a few examples of states who do not have reciprocal policy for electricians. And passing, if New Hampshire passes HB 405, it would assist in the effort to gain more affordable housing. And the last comparison I will give out of interest of time is truck drivers. This industry has been deemed one of the most essential during the COVID pandemic. They have rightly so, been viewed as heroes, keeping our shelves stocked in grocery stores and feeding America through very difficult times. If you're a truck driver based in New Hampshire, we only require an $80 fee for the license if you, have, if you have passed the proper exams. However, if you are in Rhode Island, the requirements include two years of education, passing five exams, and losing an estimated of 730 days in order to become a tractor trailer driver. Any truck driver uh, moving to Rhode Island, uh, moving from Rhode Island to New Hampshire has already jumped through significantly more burdensome regulations and we should welcome them by eliminating any additional regulatory hoops so that they can quickly begin contributing to New Hampshire communities. And just lastly, uh, New Hampshire requires a license for at least a dozen low income occupations, including some of those I have already discussed that have uh, that more than half the country does not require a license for. So if an optician or a sign language interpreter that has worked in the field in another state for years and years wants to be, wants to move to New Hampshire and, and work here, 
HB 405 will allow those who have experience and can prove that experience to cut the red, red tape that may be holding them back from working in their field in the Granite State or even moving here simply because their home state did not require a license. In the current economy, we as a state should be doing everything possible to welcome people from out of state who wish to move here and contribute to our communities. As I've outlined, most states have higher licensure requirements than New Hampshire, and thus a risk to public safety would be low. Uh, for all these reasons, we urge you to support HB 405 to give this, ne uh, this needed regulatory relief to New Hampshire's employers and employees. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Representative O'Brien. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connolly, for taking the question. In your example, you mentioned truck drivers. And uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about that because did when you get your commercial driver's license, that is a state standard, yes, but the state has adopted CFR Chapter 90 from the federal regulation, uh, federal standards of Department of Transportation. So there is already a reciprocity in the whole United States as far as a commercial truck driver. Am I correct? Uh, thank you, Representative, for the question. You are correct. There are federal standards for a lot of these licenses as well. Um, what I was specifically pointing to was the state, uh, the state requirements in order to obtain uh, the license to be, uh, there's a designation for truck driver, there's a designation for tractor trailer truck driver, uh, both in New Hampshire and in Rhode Island. And there are requirements at the state level uh, in order to obtain those. The, the requirements in Rhode Island are obviously significantly higher uh, than in New Hampshire, but they do have reciprocity when it comes to having like a CDL, you know, federal type uh, type license. Okay, follow up if I may, Madam Chair. Follow up. Yeah, um, sir, my, my comment is not to argue, but it is my opinion, a bad example, because when you do get your DOT, it's one DOT license. What you do is you get certain, uh, you apply to, uh, you know, such as air brakes. So there is a difference. Uh, you do uh, to get your license to get whether you could drive a tanker or just a cargo vehicle. And that's all done by the federal standards. So uh, New Hampshire is just the same as Hawaii when it comes down in that example. And would that not be true, even with electrician and meeting the standards of the NFPA fire code? Uh, thank, thank you for the, the question, Representative. Uh, yes, that is correct. Again, there are federal electric standards and there is vast uh, standardization. Obviously, it's, it's the same electrical code um, in, in most states. However, to, in order to quickly transfer your license, if you are in the state of, say, New York or New Jersey, uh, you have to completely reapply for the license. And, and there's a lot of, of regulations that, that are holding people back. I've I, just researching some of this bill, talking to, to electricians, they, the, uh, they do have difficulty moving from state to state if you're not within that that compact that already exists. So this bill would just simply make it easier for the rest of the people moving from, especially those high migration states um, who are moving to New Hampshire, as we know, to just make that a little, a little easier uh, for, for them to be able to quickly start, uh, start working here. Thank you, Mr. Connolly, and thank you, Madam Chair. Are there other questions? All right. On that case, thank you, uh, Mr. Connolly. And I call Tom Broderick. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, for the record, I'm Tom Broderick, Legal Counsel of the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification, or OPLC. <clears throat> The OPLC provides administrative and clerical support, record keeping services, 
in business processing for the 54 Occupational Licensing Board's commission, commissions and councils under its umbrella. So while HB 405 affects all the professions or, or nearly all the professions and thus all, almost all the boards under OPLC's umbrella, I wanna be clear that I'm speaking today on behalf of the OPLC, the agency only. I'm not speaking on behalf of the boards. I haven't been authorized to speak on behalf of the boards. Uh, so first, I'd, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this bill. The intention behind this bill is admirable, and I, I want to be clear that OPLC does not oppose reciprocity and making it easier for those individuals originally licensed in other states to come work here. Um, we have been working on some other bills uh, to join compacts and, and other things to make it easier to work here. But there are several issues with this bill, some minor, some more major that OPLC does have issues with. And for that reason, we do oppose the bill as drafted. So if the committee will, will indulge for a few minutes, OPLC's specific issues with this bill are as follows. <clears throat> On page one, lines 19 through 20, um, this is a change to the qualifications for those applying for a temporary license from the OPLC. Currently, individuals must certify that they've committed no acts or omissions, which are grounds for disciplinary action in, in the jurisdiction they're coming from. Uh, this bill would change it and limit this to only acts or omissions that are grounds for discipline in that jurisdiction, quote, as negligence or intentional misconduct related to the person's profession. Our position is this change is unnecessary and too limiting. Um, for instance, what about gross negligence or reckless conduct? Uh, also, there's a question as to when, um, when an act is, quote, related to the person's profession and what really qualifies here. Um, clearly, if an applicant for an accounting license has been convicted of embezzlement, that would apply. But if I'm, a, I'm applying for a temporary permit to become a barber, and I have a conviction for assault in another jurisdiction, is that conviction for assault related to my profession? Um, it's, it's just not clear. Uh, the second part, um, Page one, lines 25 through 26, has the same issue with the terms related to the person's profession. It's, it's just not clear. Um, page one, lines 26 through 29. <clears throat> so this is the portion of the bill that states, and I'm paraphrasing, that if an applicant has a complaint pending against them in another jurisdiction, the OPLC and the respective board shall suspend the application and may not issue or deny the license until the complaint is resolved. Uh, I, I understand the intent behind this, but this is in, in conflict with uh, RSA 541A 29A, um, which states, and I paraphrase again, that the boards must rule on an application within 60 days of receipt of that, the completed application, or else the application is deemed granted as a matter of law. So um, this conflict would need to be resolved in some way if this bill were passed. <clears throat> the next uh, issue, on page two, lines 17 through 25, this is the portion of the bill that would require a board to issue a license to someone based on work experience in another state. If their home state doesn't license that profession, <laughs> they've worked for three years in that occupation and they meet certain other requirements. So there's several issues with this. The, the, the smaller issue is on line 24. Um, they have to verify that they've worked in their profession in that home state for three years. Uh, I, I'm not sure how OPLC can verify this if they're not licensed in their home state. I suppose we would be um, basically trusting them when they say that they have, have worked in that profession for, for three years. But <clears throat> the larger issue is one we testified to on a similar bill last legislative session. Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this. I'm just going to call it unintended consequences. Um, naturopathic doctors are the prime example here. There may be others though we do, that we don't know about. <clears throat> so not all states regulate naturopathic doctors. 18 states and US territories do, New Hampshire is one of them. And in New Hampshire, naturopaths may actually um, may prescribe medications according to the naturopathic formulary, which is set by the naturopathic board. So if this bill is passed, we could have the situation where someone from a state that does not license naturopaths could open a business there, um, hang out a shingle, call themselves a naturopath, um, with little or no training. They could practice in that state for three years, move to New Hampshire, and then get a license under this provision. That individual would then, according to state law, have the ability to prescribe medications to the public with no training. So OPLC does have concerns about that. Um, 
as I said, there may be other professions with similar concerns. I just don't know. And it, it would take an extensive review of other states licensing schemes, what professions those states license and the scopes of practice of um, various uh, state licensing schemes. Um, the next concern, so that's, I think that's the biggest concern. Um, the next concern, page two, lines 26 through page three, line two. So this is the portion of the bill that would require a board to issue a license to someone who holds a private certification if their home state doesn't license that profession. They worked for two years in that profession and they hold a private certification and are in good standing with that certifying body. And they meet a few other requirements. So this is another route for those seeking licensure that are coming from another state that doesn't regulate that profession. Only now they can get a license. I, I see it as similar to the previous, but now they can get a license after two years based on the private certification rather than the three in the previous subsection. So OPLC's same concerns apply here. Um, first, how do we verify that they've worked in that profession for the two years? And second, the larger issue of unforeseen consequences, which I explained in the example of the naturopathic doctors. But the other concern here is with these private certifying bodies. Um, I wanna be clear, many outside certifying bodies are excellent and many of our boards rely on either private certifications to some extent or tests that were developed by these outside certifying groups. Um, but the fact of the matter is anyone can start a non-governmental certifying body and the state has no control over the qualifications that the certifying body would require. Um, so, you know, what would stop a unscrupulous individual from creating, um, I guess I could call it a sort of diploma mill, but for private certifications. Um, lastly, I, I just want to point out the, the truck driver example. Um, I believe this is a change to RSA 332G14. Um, RSA chapter 332G applies only to title 30 of the RSAs. Um, so it's only the professions that where their practice acts, <clears throat> excuse me, practic practice acts uh, are located in Title 30. I don't believe truck drivers are in there. Um, I think 95% of OPLC boards are in there. A few are not. Um, and then there's a few OPLC boards that are in other provisions of, of the RSAs. Um, I don't have any more testimony. I thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brower. Uh, Representative Pearson. Thank you. The, I'm going to start by saying uh, not, I don't have an opinion on this bill yet, but the, Mr. Roderick, the, the more you spoke, the more questions <laughs> I have in my mind now. You, you talked about on specifically page 124, lines 24, that section, and you talked about the conflict with RSA 541A with the 60 days of receipt requirement. There are, there are other areas in statute that have timeframes like that. And typically what is done is then, you know, you are required to, to do something within the 60 days. And typically that's just a rule they reject it to give themselves an extension. So is that an avenue that can be done as, to alleviate the concern of that 60 days when it comes to folks that have a pending investigation. Uh, yeah, I, I do believe that that issue could be resolved by adding, um, you know, perhaps um, beginning of that sentence, line 26, uh, before, if an applicant, if you could say notwithstanding RSA 541A 29A, um, that would alleviate OPLC's concern that specific concern. So, okay. The other part, the other question I have is this something you just talked about here on, on page two at the bottom of the private certifications. Uh, I, I agree, I very much agree with your assessment of, of what, what a private certification actually truly is. Do you, at the current time, does the OPLC have a a list, a database, an idea as to 
what private certification organizations are accepted by the UPLC versus ones that are not? Um, so right now, uh, right now, OPLC, we, we can't, we can't issue a license on the basis of a certification only. I guess what I meant by that is um, some boards in their practice acts uh, specifically say, um, like for instance, uh, the speech language pathology board um, says one of their requirements for licensure is it, that you have certification from ASHA, which is the Association of Speech Hearing. Uh, I, I'm butchering it, but um, an outside certifying body, it's a national body. Th there is a way around that. You can, if you're not a member of ASHA, you can take another route. But so there's examples where it's in statutes. There's also examples where boards through rules have said um, as proof of your educational experience and experience, we will accept your membership into um, X certifying organization. I don't have a comprehensive list. It would be in all the board statute. It would be board specific and you'd go in the board statutes and rules. So would a fix to this then necessarily work if it said a private certification organization recognized by the OPLC? Um, and that yeah. way those that are not recognized are, are not, can, deemed applicable and those that the OPLC has already vetted and said, yes, we do recognize that this private certification organization does bring something of value to the table and, and we hold that certification as being something of validity for what, you know, for moving forward. That would alleviate some of the concerns. I, I can't speak for the boards as I had said in the beginning. I mean, the boards are the, the experts on the profession rather than the administration. Um, so we would have to be doing that in consultation with the boards. Um, so that would require OPLC keeping a, a list of what would be acceptable, what certifying body would be acceptable for each profession. And the boards would have to determine within each board what they, I understand your management part of it, but each of the, of the 54 boards would have to decide as a board what they would accept as a private certification or not. Correct. Correct. If, if the legislature were going to go that way, I would suggest um, that that decision should be made by the boards as they are the experts in, in that profession. Representative Shewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Broderick. Um, I'm curious um, if this bill were to pass, would you say that this would um, be much more burdensome time-wise to uh, various boards of OPLC than your current methods for reciprocity? Um, well, I would, I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. It, it, it would add two more, as I read it, two more um, avenues for reciprocal licensing. Um, and uh, right now, I don't know if this is answering your question, so I'm, I'm sorry if it's not. Right now, there are many avenues for reciprocal licensing, but a lot of it depends on which board they're applying for. Um, personally, I, you know, I would love to see some sort of standardization um, so that there's uh, more similarity of process between all the boards. This doesn't get rid of any extraneous processes. It just adds two more. So I, I suppose it would take a little more time. Okay, I think that answers my question. Thank you. Representative Broda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Broderick. Um, I, um, I'm concerned about this bill because I think that to give wide license, you know, expand the licensing in this manner may have unintended consequences based on the profession that's involved. And our current 
the way we currently do this now, in my limited experience with eDNA, has been to address reciprocity on a profession on a profession basis with this with a certain board. Because at that time, the board can decide for itself what they're going to recognize as the, as the qualification, whether it be private certification or um, uh, work experience. So how and and so my question to you is: Is that not um, from an OPLC management standpoint, considering your position versus the board, is it not easier and more uh, and less? Um, and a path of having less unintended consequences to continue in the way this, this committee yeah. has addressed reciprocity through the board themselves and the profession. Um, I, yes, I mean, to your point, and I, I think rewording a point from pre, <laughs> repoint previous, scar, excuse me, a point I made previously, the, uh, you know, we license 54 different professions. They all have and I know bits and pieces of each profession and so do the staff that work here, but there's no way we know. There's a reason why we have uh, people in the profession on these boards and that is to determine matters like this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I think you've answered my question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Goley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Broderick for taking my question. Uh, and looking at this, uh, it says any person shall have uh, worked for at least three years in a lawful occupation. It doesn't say the number of hours in the year. It just says three years. Could three years be I worked one week each year and that's classified as I was doing the occupation for three years? Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, that would be another issue here. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I turn on my light so Tom can see me. Um, so this strikes me as a rowboat with a lot of little leaks in it. Um, but uh, the question I have is, uh, it, it, do we have a flood of people coming in from uh, surrounding areas or wherever uh, seeking uh, licensing in the in the areas uh, that this bill addresses, and w can you comment on whether we ha whether we actually would be justified in fixing all the, each one of these little leaks, uh, or any of the little leaks for that matter, uh, with the staff that you time that you have available uh, to to meet. Uh, the needs of people who want to come here and work. Thank you, Representative Schmidt. Um, I unfortunately I may need to ha have to get back to you as legal counsel. I don't see uh, the everyday requests that are coming in for reciprocity. I, I would probably have to check with our administrative team. Um, so I I'm happy to get back to you with something in writing. I, I will know. I mean, the, with the amount of emergency licenses, et cetera, that we're issuing under um, COVID and the extra pandemic work, we are stretched pretty thin. But um, to your specific question of how um, how many individuals this would uh, help, I'm happy to talk with my executive director and uh, more the administrative arm and get some of that for you. Uh, follow up. Follow up. So you have. I mean, you, you, you've got enough work to, to fill out your day, I'm sure. And just all the aspects that you've addressed in, in this bill show uh, a command of the, uh, the, the subject material that you deal with on a regular basis. Uh, because, as I said, this is a boat with a lot of little leaks. Um, and ultimately, uh, it, it, it all has to be fixed because we, we can't have we can't have you fixing half of it and, and not the other half then that, that's not the kind of bill we want to pass in this committee so uh, I, I'm not sure how, how quickly we have to act on the bill uh, the chair can speak to that but but uh, as I say it, it, this is a, it would be a lot of work for the agency to uh, to, to get at 
if there's not a lot of people uh, waiting in any one of these professions to come into New Hampshire from surrounding areas. Um, so I think I think it needs a lot more work before we could think of acting on it. I have a question, Mr. Broderick, that you I hope you would look into. Sure. Some years ago, we passed a requirement that asked the boards to post what states had equivalent requirements, because most of the Practice Act say that they shall license people from states with equivalent requirements. And at two years after that law passed, I had I saw no such listings. And I would hope that if you could find out if any of the boards have bothered to put up, say, the state of Massachusetts is fine. The state of Maine is inadequate because of this or whatever the, the issue is. Because that sort of information that the board should know from the licenses that, and requests for reciprocity that they receive, and they should make it public. So I hope, it, could you find out which, if any boards have done something like that? Sure. I, I do know that our boards have a, I think each board has a like reciprocity tab on our website, but um, I can find out what's posted on that tab. Um, and yes, I, I can get that information. Thank you. And I would mention that I know someone from Washington State who is considering to moving to New Hampshire. He is a licensed electrician in Washington, and he had the requisite apprenticeship, including 8,000 hours of supervised practice, which is the same requirement we have here. And he was told that if he were to come to New Hampshire, he would have to repeat that 8,000 hours rather than being able to transfer his journeyman's license. And that's something that is totally unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. Of course, that's third hand verbal. I didn't speak to the electrician's board myself, but if if that's the kind of response we're giving to people who are thinking of moving to this area and they call up the board and say, hey, I'm a licensed electrician, what do I need to do to get a license? And they're told they have to start four, four or five years back. That's a very bad problem we have. And I'm sure this bill is intended to address that. End of speech. All right. Are there any other questions for Mr. Broderick? Okay, seeing none. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House Bill 405? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Broderick. And uh, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 405. Just a comment. The bill that we're hearing has nothing to do with the problem you just described. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, it is 3.35. I think we will take a 10-minute break and then come back and resume with the executive session on House Bills 274 and 591. Probably 591 first. Well, funds for the start now. Yeah. Well, just so you know, I muted the committee room and um, just you'll, you'll need to unmute when you're ready to resume. Thanks.
Okay, we are now unmuted and the camera is on the whole time. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for lasting through a uh, day that finished better than it started. All right. On House Bill 274, we amended it with uh, Representative Abrami's amendment that clarified the fee section. Both Representative Lackus and Representative Shewitt have submitted amendments where that part is identical. The only question- Madam Chair, yes. excuse me, you mentioned House Bill 274. I believe you're referring to House Bill 591. You are totally correct, I apologize. You're absolutely right. This is House Bill 591, the Liquor Commission. Thank you. The, the difference between the amendment we have already adopted, the Shewitt Amendment and the Lekas Amendment, it are only in the last section about the two positions. So I think the simplest way to handle it will be to debate what we want to do with the two positions, whether to delete them completely, whether to leave them as our last amendment was as, ex as examiners, or change them as the Shewitt Amendment calls for into investigators, and then pass the appropriate amendment so that we only have one amendment to deal with. Uh, Ms. Sparling begged me to make sure we only pass one amendment. So I will I will do as she requests. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, that would mean, you know, unless you pass um, 0116, the Abrami amendment, you'd need to reconsider and and, um, and turn it down. Since you Once are, you we have something. decided what we want to do, we can make sure to adopt the, the amendment that does what we want. Right. So, uh, under the circumstances, I'd like to ask Representative Shewitt to briefly explain why she wants to change the examiners we have in our current amendment to inspectors, and then I'll ask Representative Lekas to explain why he wants to eliminate the positions and then open it up for debate. Okay? Sounds like a plan. Okay, Diane, go ahead. I thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I, my amendment uh, was drafted so that uh, technically the amendment that the committee has already adopted, which changed the fee structure, would still be in place and basically putting it back to the original bill that called for two investigators. Um, as folks may recall, during the questioning of the chief of the inspection officers, um, he indicated that, yes, he could use two more investigators. Uh, the numbers that they gave us, uh, the fact that there are approximately 5,600 facilities, and with 15 investigators, uh, that looked to me about a ratio of one investigator for every 375 facilities, which means that in ratio, the investigators could probably get to one facility a year, uh, each facility once a year, let me put it that way. So it struck me that it was likely that um, they could use two more investigators. We heard that examiners, if they found something egregious, uh, would have to then call for an enforcement officer. I hope that you have all seen the um, email from Lieutenant Morrison, uh, a former investigator, um, as to the need for 
uh, having an investigator rather than an examiner uh, do this kind of work. Uh, he felt that it would actually be more efficient. And uh, so on that basis, uh, that's why I am putting this amendment forward to put those two investigator positions back in place. Thank you for the um, time. Um, yes, I mean, separate from the changes in licensing done in this bill, there may or may not be a need for either additional investigators or examiners. Um, I don't know that that should be dealt with in the same bill. I think the uh, most places that sell, I mean, it looks like the effect of this would be to add some, uh, have some places that sell uh, alcohol, uh, be able to add tobacco, a tobacco license at a reduced fee. Uh, and if the liquor commission is already uh, have, you know, reviewing and inspecting a location that currently has a liquor license, I don't see there would be significantly more work if the same place also has a tobacco license. Um, and so my amendment would eliminate the positions would include neither uh, investigators or examiners. Um, can I ask you a question? And that is, is it normal to include positions in statute or is that normally part of the budget submitted by the governor or the legislature? It's like that both ways. So it would not have to be done that way. And if, if the Liquor Commission felt that they needed more positions, it could be done through the normal budget process. And that's what I would uh, suggest should be done, rather than including it kind of as almost extraneous thing to purpose bill. All right. Thank you, Representative Lackus. That br brings us to the point of debating these positions. Uh, Representative Allegro. Um, I had a question that uh, either of the uh, amendment sponsors could answer. I just want to be 100% clear on the role of investigators. Is it to make regular annual or semi-annual visits, or is it to investigate complaints? And then I'll, I'll, I may have to follow up, please. The investigators, they do both semi-regular visits. Uh, and they also follow up to complaints. Okay, uh, so I was just wondering if the uh, concerns about a ratio or a, a, a once a year visit uh, is is necessarily a concern because um, you know that that's the ratio of investigators to total number of <laughs> institutions, but not necessarily the ratio of investigators to total visits. We have no data as to the number okay. of total visits. Yes, Representative. May, may I speak? What? May I speak? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, the more I hear about it, the more I am confused because I have to apply uh, committee hearing discounts to some of the things that I hear. I don't know how audits work. I don't know what the investigators do or auditors do. Uh, I'm calling it auditors or examiners. I, mean, you know, I have this conception that an examiner comes in, most of the time it's a routine audit. There's no, I don't know even what they do. Do they count liquor bottles? Do they look at receipts? Once in a while, they're gonna find somebody that's loading up their trunk or selling it or do, do. and I'm all of a sudden, not understanding and not in a position to understand. And what this says to me is this is not our area of expertise. This may be a great idea, but I don't know that. I think this should be split off and ways and means ought to be looking at this because they deal with liquors uh, all the time. I have liquor around Christmas. Uh, so that's, right. I, 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 it isn't that I'm a, I'm opposed to this bill, be that portion of the bill being here. It may be a wonderful light. Well, I've said it. Okay. I'm going to be calling on people in the order that they have not yet spoken today. So, Representative Fontenot. Thank you, 
uh, Madam Chair. Um, a short follow-up on Representative Sitek's point about the examiners. I'm not sure um, if the examiner position exists at, at this point, um, or if the Liquor Commission, at, Liquor Commission has exclusively investigators and, and that it was this bill that was going to then create these two examiner uh, positions and, and if those positions are adequately defined. I don't recall that uh, testimony. Thank you. Representative Goley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I too am, I will support uh, Representative Schuett's amendment uh, for the investigators. Uh, the original bill was for investigators. Not sure, I think, whether it was just cost savings, uh, looking to get positions to go to examiners, uh, but also want to just remind folks that during the testimony we did hear uh, from the department that uh, businesses out there, the feedback from them on the uh, individuals going in and helping out in the workplace uh, with uh, rules and laws and regulations was positive and that they were receiving positive feedback on their employees. Uh, Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a, being neither a smoker nor a drinker, I haven't been in a New Hampshire liquor store or any liquor store for, I don't know, a couple of years. <clears throat> uh, so my first question is, <clears throat> excuse me, do the investigators, uh, can they deal with cigarette issues or tobacco issues as well as liquor issues? Yes. Okay, that was my assumption. So I think, if, first of all, if we are going to go for personnel at all, we ought to go to investigate, go for investigators. They are the more useful and, and valuable employees to have for the Liquor Commission. Um, so the question for me only becomes whether we want to, uh, well, see whether we have a majority for investigators uh, and then whether we want to go forward with adding positions at all. Thank you. Uh, Representative Perotta. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to, um, looking back at my notes, the um, this bill is going to mean ways and means after it goes, it comes here, after it leaves here, excuse me. And um, the way we had someone named Mark, Arthmet, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce his name. Um, Arthmet, Arsenault, I think. No, no, no. Artemaganian. Oh, no. and um, he, oh, that one. Yes. He 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 said that applications have gone up through by 167 in the um, liquor uh, license area that includes smoke shops. There's 5,661 active licenses, and they have 26 investigators. Some are full time and some are part time. And each investigator in, has approximately 377 licenses that they're responsible for. Um, it was also noted by um, Representative Abrami that these two investigators would be sworn officers and they would be paid in time by the fees collected from this change in fee schedule. Um, let me just see what other thing that I can say to be helpful. Uh, the also, um, Catherine Frey from New Futures also testified in favor of the, in, in support of the bill because she felt that enforcement, which I guess is part of the investigator's role, would help with those who are younger than 21 years old. Um, the uh, Arden Moore, who's the state liquor commissioner, also uh, testified. And um, he was supportive of the amendment, especially with the, um, the uh, fee remedy. So that I hope that helps. But it seemed to me that the um, that most people that testified were in support of the investigators because of the workload and the enforcement regulations that are needed in this industry. Thank you. Okay, Representative Fellows. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was having, I've had this sense that one of the concerns might be the cost of these two positions. So I looked up um, the personnel classifications for these jobs and the investigators, which are the lower level, um, which are the higher position, their labor grades, there's two classes, a one and a two, and those are labor grades 19 and 20. And the examiners, there are three levels, 17, 20, and 23. So there's, and these are not high level positions, the classified labor grades I've seen, the lowest one I've ever seen was eight. And the highest you can get is 35. And that's somebody who usually supervises um, quite a few people. So I don't think that the cost is really an issue on this, if, if that's what's um, been holding some people back. So um, I certainly um, support the investigators. I also looked at the job description, descriptions and um, the investigators, the job description was last updated in 2017. The other ones were last updated in 2010 which it doesn't prove, but it um, in a way s supports the um, representative Fontenot's thought that perhaps um, nobody, they, they don't even employ any of that position at the moment. So that's what I have to say. All right, Representative Shewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Gurr made a couple of my points that the bill will on to uh, ways and means. I just wanted to respond to Representative Cytek's concerns that uh, my main intent is that we would just be endorsing the policy of adding these two positions. And of course, ways and means would make the final decision as to the economics. Of Thank you. Okay. Representative Pearson, you have a comment? I have a question for Representative Fellows. Yes, go ahead, go ahead and ask. All right, Representative Fellows, so uh, just, just so I heard you right, the pay grade for an investigator is 19 and 20. The examiner is 17, 20, and 23. The examiners have a higher pay grade than the investigators, potentially? Um, at the top level, I mean, I'm just, I'm just reading from the database that has all the job descriptions and classifications. Uh, that's not telling you if anybody's in that slot, but that's correct. Those are the labor grades. And they're not, those are not high labor grades. Right, no, right. I guess, I guess the, my presumption with the investigators were paid more than examiners, but I guess that's not the case. Maybe the, the higher ones are the auditors or something. Very likely. Uh, I would like to, to mention that at the hearing that Representative Abrami mentioned that the amendment that eliminated the duplicate license fees for tobacco plus alcohol places, which is a lot of them, would in fact make it unlikely that the fees collected would cover the cost of the auditors. But that's, we don't know that for sure. We don't know what their, their budget is like. And I think that's something that ways and means and finance need to work out. So, Representative Allegro. Yeah, I did want to chime in again, but I, I asked the question of what investigators do versus examiners. And we're sitting here debating whether or not we're going to essentially authorize two employees uh, or two employee classes, one of two employee classes, neither of which any of us appears to know what their function is. Uh, so maybe we should consider holding off on this one until we know precisely what those roles are. Excuse me, the sun is in my eyes. I can't, um, can't see the screen. But maybe we should hold off until we've uh, understood what an investigator, what an examiner does, what their pay grades are, whether that's uh, even a concern. Uh, just a thought. I don't want to defer anybody else for your time. Um, I'm, I'm new to the committee, uh, but it seemed a little strange to me that this bill came to EDMA in the first place. 
and um, certainly strange that we would be deciding whether or not to have positions of what type, as the previous speaker said, you know, that we don't fully understand. And that's part of why um, I have the amendment to remove them all together. And if Ways and Means feels there is a need to add them, they can do that either this bill or someplace else in what they're handling. And that's what I would suggest doing. Yeah. The, uh, the positions could be easily added in, this, in the budget if they are deemed to be appropriate. But as you say, we don't know what these people do. And we don't know what they... So we don't know the di really the difference between the two positions very well at all. And and, um, and we also you know have as far as I know uh, seriously analyzed the actual needs of um, of a liquor commission and you know, have any understanding of whether they really do need these positions and what type. Like. Some side Very quickly to Representative Shewitt, you mentioned that we were the policy committee and that Ways and Means would do the dollars and cents of it. And I think they really, I don't want to be trying to be Mr. Last Word, but I think it's really a policy decision for them. If they if they want the two invest, if you, if you can sell the two investigators to them i'll vote for it but right now i i i'm going to kick the can up the road or down the road wherever the road is <laughs> i'm not at all sure why we got this bill in the first place fees belong with ways and means and commerce normally deals with the details of the liquor commission and the licenses we don't this is totally outside of our bailiwick and none of us are familiar with the type of, of issues that are brought out. And if we were in a normal year where we could, where we were meeting in session, I would have asked to vacate this bill because it's not really appropriate for us. So uh, I agree that we should pass, pass the, the fee changes that Representative Brahmi says correct a mistake. And, Everybody seems to agree about that, but I'm not personally comfortable with adding new positions when we didn't really get a good understanding of what they do or why we need them. Okay, Representative Goldie has a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And all the discussion about not knowing what these folks do, I thought it was explained to us uh, in the hearing that um, the examiners do the auditing and looking at the records where the investigators have the enforcement authority. Um, so I'm not sure where we're not knowing what they do because from my recollection, that was explained to us um, from the department in the hearing. Thank you, I'm glad you got it. So could you explain it to me? I thought I just did that the examiners were the ones that do the auditing and looking at the records and receipts. And my understanding was the investigators uh, actually had the law enforcement authority to um, actually follow up on the cases and, pro and prosecute them. Thank you. Um, even if that's true, you know, we don't have an overview really of the workload of the department. I don't think we know how many employees, what type they had, and what they really need. And so you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable supporting any positions when I can't really tell if they really are needed. And it's really not, I don't see it as our job to do that. Anyway, so. Representative Fellows. Um. Yes, Madam Chair. I'm just, if you want me to read a couple of words from the job descriptions, I can, or I can um, take me a little bit of time. I could uh, email them to you. There's five of them all together if you want to see all three of the layers. But it's very clear that the examiners, I'm just reading words from the first two items of the job description. Um, audits verify sales uh, delivery reports and fiscal audits prepares reports of tax payments and violations and the other one the investigator um, supports 
licensing, by doing ex inspections, issuance of new and renewed licenses. And the second uh, item talks about conducts criminal investigations. So those they always list what the person does most at on the first lines of the description. So Thank that you. should some Representative Shewitt, you have another comment? Yes, um, I have known um, a few actual liquor investigators. Um, mostly they are retired police officers who are familiar with the laws and they investigate, uh, for example, charges of someone who has gotten a DUI, who uh, then they investigate whether or not the bartender involved, for example, in a bar um, was not following the law about um, uh, refusing to serve someone who has over imbibed, uh, things of that nature. Um, and again, I will just say that basically I put this amendment in to return the bill to the original way that we got it, except for the um, changes in the uh, tax ramifications. And that's the way I felt it should go ways and means. I'm sure that the ways and means members have much more knowledge of what investigators do and the implications of this bill. Thank you. Hey, Representative Fellows. Sorry, I thought I put my hand down. Okay. I did put my hand down. Representative Rhoda. No, it's been eight years. Sorry, I lowered my hand instead of unmuting myself. Um, I just want to reiterate that it, it was, these positions were described in the hearing and also the need for these descriptions, these, these positions was also um, requested by not only Representative Abrami, but by the Liquor Commission. So I don't um, feel comfortable taking them out of the, out of the bill. Um, and I would rather, I would rather support um, Representative Schuett's amendment rather than that of Representative Luckis, no, um, no harm intended. All right, thank you. Representative Pearson. I think it's been it's been made fairly clear that, that this is really something that should be handled by the other committee. So I'm I'm fine with the Lekas amendment. Let's get it over to them and let them deal with the particulars that they're used to. Does anyone else have anything to say while we're in this just discussion mode? I do have a quick comment. If Ways and Means finds that these positions are not necessary, then they can take them out. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, rather than having a specific vote on the specific amendment, I think we have a three choice vote if the clerk can handle it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I have plenty of papers. Okay, <laughs> fine. So I think we will. The, the simplest thing to do is to vote on whether we think there should be examiners, inspectors, or no positions in the bill. And then we will adopt the amendment that, that it's our will. That's agreeable. Um, Hearing no shouts. You, oh wait, I, I think it's investigator uh, maybe you said this and i couldn't hear it quite right investigators or examiners or no position correct i thought you said inspectors so it's investigators or examiners correct okay uh okay what, 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 well, what is what is the vote the I'm, vote is what? believe this bill should be amended or left alone and whether we should send it forward with investigators, examiners, or no positions. 
Right, but what are we voting, yes or no? Or are we going to vote investigators or examiners? No, no positions, investigators or examiners. This is a it's a three-way vote. This is a survey. Essentially, it's a survey. Like a straw poll. Whatever. Yeah. After we decide what the committee wants, then we will find the amendment that, that puts that into proper language and adopt it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little unusual. Yes, thank you. Okay, at this restaurant, you have a choice of three columns investigator um, or Zippo. Uh, Representative uh, Werner, I'm sorry, yes. Zero. Okay, low calorie. I'll vote zero on the grounds that we've talked about. Representative Pearson? Zero. Representative Yakubovich? Zero. Representative Lekas? Zero. Representative Allegro? Zero. Representative uh, Bailey? Zero. Representative Lanzara? Zero. Representative San Anastasio? Zero. Representative Goley? Investigators. Uh, Representative Shewitt? Investigators. Re <coughs> Representative Judy. Unmute yourself. Est-ce que tu veux? Okay. Mm -hmm. Where is he? Investigators. Yes, investigators. And your face, please. Uh, Representative, uh, uh, excuse me. Show us. I said investigators. I sure. Okay, well, we, we know it's Representative Schmidt. Investigators. Uh, Representative Schultz. Investigators. Representative Fellows. Investigators. Representative Fontenot. Investigators. Representative Grota. Investigators, please. Representative O'Brien. Investigators. I didn't mean to step on your line, Representative Broda. It does look like it's quite binary, 10, uh, 9, 10. All right. All right. The current status of the bill is that we adopted an amendment that put in examiners, which. Wait. <laughs> so. I didn't, I didn't hear a vote of the chair, and I didn't hear what the outcome was. Excuse me. Uh, That's you correct. I wasn't asked. I'm sorry. I vote, I'm sorry. I vote with the zeros. So we have nine in favor of investigators, 10 in favor of no positions, and nobody wants examiners. Well, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> <laughs> so the amendment we previously adopted has examiners. Nobody wants to do that. So I would invite a motion to reconsider our vote to adopt that amendment. Um, but the only problem is that if we don't adopt that amendment and we want to adopt my amendment, then we go back to the old fees in the original bill. And also, you, know, you can't you can't do that because my amendment is set up to use the section numbers in the wrong number. Oh, okay. So that instead of a complete amendment, you just have a delete the positions. Correct. Okay, so you don't have to reconsider that. But Madam Chairman, you do have amendment um, 0269, which is the fees from the Abrami amendment and contains no positions. We do, excellent. Do. McGuire That's amendment um, 0269. That Ms. Marling read my mind and had prepared for us. No, no, <laughs> you did it on your own. <laughs> You're right, that amendment has my name on it. Yeah. So in any event, we want to reconsider the motion to adopt the, the Abrami Amendment, which nobody wants, and then we can vote on the, if we choose to not adopt that amendment, we can adopt my amendment and, and have a minority support recommending the Shewitt Amendment, which is what it sounds like. So I will... Um, 
invite a motion to reconsider our vote on the Abrami Amendment 0116. So moved. All right, Representative Allegro moves to reconsider. Is there a second? Okay. Um, I'll second that. Uh, Allegro moves to reconsider our motion, our motion to adopt that amendment. And we will vote on the motion to reconsider. Oh, one one six. Yes. So the mo the motion is to reconsider. If you think the amendment oh one one six that we previously adopted does not reflect the will of the committee, then you will vote yes to reconsider. If you want to pass the bill with, with that amendment, vote no. The clerk will call the roll. Representative Werner. Yes. Rep uh, the clerk votes yes. Representative Pearson. Yes. Yakubovich. Representative. Yes. Yes. Rep I'm sorry. Representative Legas. Yes. Representative Allegro. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Lanzaro. Yes. Representative Santo Nastasso. Yes. Representative Goley. Yes. Representative Short. Yes. Representative Judy. You me? We. Oui. We. Oui. Okay. Uh, Representative Schmidt. Yes. Yes. Representative Schultz. Yes. Uh, Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Funtno. Yes. Representative Broda. Yes. Representative O'Brien. Yes. And this time the chair. Yes. 19 zero. All right. We have voted to reconsider. Therefore, the next action is to revote the Thought to pass on Amendment 0116. And again, this is the corrected license fees plus the change to uh, examiners. I'm sorry, M Madam Chair, is this the Shewitt Amendment? No, this is the Abrami. We voted to reconsider, so now we're reconsidering. I oh, would, okay, okay, all right. I'm so sorry. I, I, on the straw poll, I would expect everybody to vote no because no one wanted this choice. Madam Chair, yes. I I need um, Pam to send me the the, um, the amendment yes. that, that begins with two to something. I have I have like three or four amendments. I don't have the one that I think is the last most recent one. There are copies in the committee room, just so you, for the people there, and I'll send it out to um, everybody in email in a sec. What is it, and what's the number? It's 0269. I don't have that one. Thank you. Sure. Just, just for clarification, can you explain exactly okay. what, what a yes or a no vote means? Yes. A yes vote means that you want to adopt the Abrami Amendment with the change to examiners instead of inspectors. Examiners. What's that? Examiners. Thank you. Examiners. A no vote means that you are not satisfied with that amendment for whatever reason. So this is the reconsider the motion of the adopted amendment 0116H. Is everyone properly confused? <laughs> yes. Okay. In that case. No more than usual. Okay. The clerk will call the roll. 
Representative Werner. No. Repres uh, the clerk votes no. Representative Pearson. No. Representative Yakubovich. No. Representative Lekas. No. El Representative Allegro. No. Representative Bailey. No. Representative Lanzaro. No. Representative Santo Nastaso. No. Representative Goey. No. Representative Schuett. No. Representative Judy. No. Ah. Representative Schmidt. No. Representative Schultz. No. Representative Fellows. No. Representative Funk, no. No. Representative Grodin. No. Representative O'Brien. No. And the chair. No. Zero to nine. No. All right. That mode that amendment has now failed. The bill is open to further amendment. And Representative Lekas, you have a motion? Yeah. I'd like to move uh, on to pass or adoption of uh, Amendment 0269H. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, that was um, 0269H. 0269H. Um, you made this motion, Representative Lekas, mm -hmm. and who seconded? Representative Pearson. Pearson. If I'm, I'm sorry, I missed on the 019. Who made the motion and seconded on that, please? Just before. Let me recon. Uh, 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 I believe Representative Lekas, I think, made that motion. Well, the Allegro did the reconsideration. The no, that, I, right, I made the move motion to reconsider. Oh, we, we didn't have to move. The motion to reconsider authorizes the veto. Okay, so this. Uh, there was no, no motion made. So the, the, the motion pending is or, uh, uh, the amendment, the adoption of, M of 0269H. Correct. Is made by Representative Lekas and uh, seconded by Representative Pearson. And as we discussed, this amendment has the same license fees and that stops. No, no positions are added. Okay. Is there any discussion? Just for clarification, this is the amendment where the fee schedule is correct and there are no positions. Correct. All right. Okay, that, if there's no further discussion, the clerk will call the roll. Representative uh, Werner. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Pearson. Yes. Representative Yakubovich. Yes. Representative Lekas. Yes. Representative Allegro. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Lansara. Yes. Representative Santo Nastaso. Yes. Representative Goley. Yes. Uh, no, I'm sorry. No. I understand. You caught, you caught me off guard there. I didn't think I was up. Uh, I'll, I'll buy you and Representative Schmidt a drink afterward. Um, I think I missed somebody on the roll call. I Dr. Stazzo? I did. I called him. He said I he answered yes. No. I did not? No. No, you did not. That's why I was not prepared to answer. Yes. I heard him. President uh, Santa Nastaso, could you repeat your vote for those who didn't hear it? Yeah, I vote uh, yes. The representative Goley has rep voted no. Representative Schuett. Representative Shewitt votes no. Representative Judy. No. 
Representative Schmidt. No. Representative Schultz. No. Representative Fellows. No. Representative No. No. Representative Grota. No. Representative O'Brien. No. The chair. Yes. Yes. Ten nine. All right. So is there a motion? You don't have to. You just move the 591 on to pass with the amendment. Okay. Uh, then I'd like to make a motion on to pass as amended. On 591. And the, and the amendment is a Lekas amendment? Uh, no, it's the McGuire amendment, actually. It's the Carol's amendment that we just voted on that updates the fees to the same as the Abrami one, but removes the position. I'm so sorry. Of course, the McGuire amendment. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep. Right. Uh, is there a second? All right. Moved by Representative Leck is seconded by Representative Pearson. Is there any discussion? Just a question, Claire. Yes. So now we're voting on the amended. Uh, yes. Bill. We're voting on the final recommendation to the House, and it's ought to pass this amendment. I may run out of paper. Any further discussion? Questions? Seeing any. The motion is ought to pass with amendment 269H and the clerk will call the roll. Representative Warner. Yes. Rep clerk of TS. Representative Pearson. Yes. Representative Yakubovich. Yes. Representative Lekas. Yes. Representative Rowe. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Lanzara. Yes. Representative Santo Nastaso. Yes. Representative Goley. No. Representative Short. No. Representative Judy. No. Representative Schmidt. No. Representative Schultz. No. Representative Fellows. No. Representative Font, no. Yes. I'm sorry, Representative Font, no. Yes. Representative Broda. No. Representative O'Brien. No. And the chair? Yes. Uh, 10, 9, 9, 9, 11, 11, 8. All right. The vote is 11 to 8. This will be a regular calendar bill. Is there going to be a minority report and who's going to write it? Uh, did we get a response? Not yet. The, all right, the if there is a minority report, it's due to me no later than Monday. All right, we will let you know uh, by the end of the day. Or just send it in. I mean, it's, it's Thursday. Okay, just one down. So I just have a question. So it'll be listed with just one amendment, just the last one. Is that correct? Yes. The minority proposes to adopt the bill ought to pass with the Shewitt Amendment, for example, which is certainly a legitimate position, then both amendments will be listed in the calendar. Thank you. I was going to suggest. 
of ITL failed. Representative Pearson? I have, a, I have an amendment to bring forward. Motion is one to pass and you present an amendment. Motion is one to pass and I present amendment 0295H. What this amendment does is I this. Is, is there a second? Oh, sorry. This is just for, I don't have a copy. This is removed, so. It's, it's on the table. Okay. Representative Pearson, would you like to speak to your amendment? Thank you. Uh, what the amendment does here is the amendment changes this bill to remove group one out of it. It leaves group two uh, in the bill and it leaves it at the 5% as originally written. So if you were looking at the fiscal note, group one would just, the reason they didn't add a new fiscal note is because it just eliminates group one. So the fiscal note for group two would still be applicable and appropriate to the amendment. May I ask a question? Uh, yes. So what you're saying is that only the contributions to group one would, come, would be paid, 5% of that would be paid by the state, and then the teachers, which is group two. No. No. I've got this backwards. Do I have it backwards? Backwards, yep. Yes. Okay, so group one, okay, the group one, the teachers would pay by the state, but then the fire department and police department would all stay still the responsibility of the municipalities. Is that what you're saying? You have it, you have it opposite. So the 5% state contribution would, would kick in for police and fire. Yeah. Group one, the teachers would stay as they are today with no change. And why is that? The, the reason for that really honestly has to do with what I, what I have personally witnessed in the last four years of municipalities tightening their belts and some reorganization, especially with the expanded roles that police and fire have had during the pandemic. And what I have seen from group one is the exact opposite. So... There, there comes a point in time where I, we continue to give money to to group one, in essence, to the to the to education, and for every dollar the state seems to give them, they want a dollar twenty-five, and I I am I'm literally just kind of at wit's end with the lack of fiscal restraint that's going on. So I am I'm just really not interested in providing any more dollars in that avenue until I can see some sort of willingness on the part of the school districts to do what everybody else on the town side of government has done, and that is really look at things and do what's necessary to live within their means. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. I do have a comment on that. The very member of this caucus used the fire department as an example and how they didn't want to pay for other people's fire department and police department. So again, I go back to, we are one community and you have the feeling of unrestrained budget expansion by the school on your part may, be, has, is not, may not be based on data because it's certainly not true in my school district and many school districts on the seacoast. So I am, I, am, I, I am very concerned about these broad statements that are made without data. And I don't support that amendment. I'm sorry. Representative Lekas, do you wish to comment on your second? Um, I just, uh, to, I agree with what uh, Representative Pearson said, and I will add that, uh, um, you know, well, I prefer none of the money coming from the state budget. If we're gonna do it, I, I'd rather be a smaller amount. All right, Representative Fellows. Um, I'm sorry, I 
just skip over me. Okay, Representative O'Brien. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with the deepest of respect to my fellow representative, uh, Representative Pearson, uh, with his bill, I think by his own admission, what he has just said with the school department is his entitled opinion. But let me express mine. When I wrote uh, House Bill 274, uh, it was intended to give some form of relief to municipalities at all, every single corner of the state from the Canadian border down to the Massachusetts border from the Atlantic Ocean to the state of Vermont. Now, the thing is, if you have a particular issue with your particular community, that's why we have elections. But I'd much rather stay focused right on what 274 does. As we know, we discussed before, the state used to pay 35%. It was teared down to zero. Since the 10 years it's been teared down to zero, municipalities had to face this burden of making up the difference. The structure of the NHRS and the contribution rates didn't really change that much. The only thing, the only person that got a break was the state of New Hampshire. Now, I'm going to use Nashua as the example. And you can refer this to your own particular communities, although Nashua's numbers will probably be bigger. Manchester's may be uh, a little bit bigger than Nashua's, but they're all comparatively the same. <clears throat> In the city of Nashua, we have 180 police officers that are in the New Hampshire retirement system. Uh, we have 165 uh, firefighters in the New Hampshire retirement system, and we have 950 teachers. Now, as we look at the Pearson's Amendment, the Pearson's Amendment's got to remove the majority or the largest chair out of the supposedly given the break to your tax to your constituents who pay taxes, as in the example as we heard from the mayor of Nashua. In that example, four point four million dollars of taxpayers' money is going to the New Hampshire retirement system. So therefore, let's look what is in the example Nashua's contribution rate. The police pay three hundred and thirty-eight uh, thousand dollars. The fire pays two hundred sixty-two thousand dollars. With the combination of adding those numbers up, of uh, basically six hundred thousand dollars. The teachers, which is Group One, is six hundred and forty-eight thousand. Now you'll say, "Geez." Representative O'Brien, you gave us numbers that there was 950 teachers. Again, that's the largest group. But let's keep in mind that teachers only pay 7% into the New Hampshire retirement system. Police and fire being group two, and that's why the difference of group two, uh, not to be commingled or anything or confused with group one, uh, basically pays basically a little south of 13%, 12 point something. Now, how does this affect, uh, this will greatly affect, like I say, the city of Nashua. It will affect your community, Manchester, everybody else, because basically the Nashua tax rate as compared to everybody else, you raise the, uh, $2 million seems to be what raises the tax rate 1%. Now, if you should happen to live in a community where your individual town uh, has smaller than compared to Nashua, you do pay teachers in the New Hampshire retirement system. You might even have police officers. You may not have 165 officers in your community, but you may have a few, you may have five. So you are paying within the percentages because nobody gets the break within to the New Hampshire time system. If you're fortunate or unfortunate, I, I would say fortunate to have volunteer firefighters, then you're not paying anything into the New Hampshire retirement system because 
as in a volunteer status, uh, they don't contribute to the New Hampshire retirement system. But again, if you have teachers and if you have police officers, you are making that contribution into the uh, New Hampshire retirement system. So based upon those numbers, I don't want you to follow down the rabbit hole of what 274 is supposed to do. If you believe like I do, the intention of this bill was to give a break to municipalities of their tax burden into the New Hampshire retirement system. And we only asked for 5%, which was prudent and judicial. Keep in mind, originally the state paid the 35%. So I feel when I authored this bill, I didn't come in high on the hog with it. I think I came in with a reasonable dollar amount that would be prudent. And uh, I want you to keep that in mind as you consider the vote on this, that this was a prudent attempt, attempt to alleviate the tax burden that was downshifted to the municipalities and thus got downshifted into the, uh, the taxpayers of your community. So I urge you all to vote with me to shoot down uh, Representative Pearson's, I think well-intentioned amendment, but to shoot that down so see that my subsequent a motion could be made to ought to pass on 274 standalone. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pearson. <clears throat> I, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative O'Brien. I, I am a student of the of the history of the state pension system. That's something I've, I've really worked on myself. If I had assurances that this would provide tax relief, I would love this. The problem is, is that historically, and I can be from Derry and, and being virtually a, outside of college, pretty much a lifelong resident of Derry, the history shows me otherwise, that the taxpayers will not see this as a relief at all. And so I embrace the concept of that, and I, I applaud you for, for recognizing the situation, because it is a situation. I don't have the historical context within my own community to have that faith. And I'll give you an example. Since 1996, the enrollment in the Dairy School District has gone down every year since 1996. We have 1,000 less students in K through 8 than we did 20 years ago which would equate to around an $8 million decrease in our budget. Our school district budget is up $16 million. So I have no faith and confidence whatsoever that this money is gonna be used for tax relief. And, I'm, and I, it's, I don't profess to know what the other communities are specifically doing, but when I see things in the city of Manchester where reports are coming out telling them they need to mothball a high school and three elementary schools, and here we are with them not doing it, I just, I'm seeing just too much of this to, to lack the faith to go along with the concept. That, that is the origin of this, Representative O'Brien. And uh, again, I appreciate your angle on it. I really do, and I do recognize it, and I wish it was true. <laughs> it just, in my mind, it isn't. Representative Fellows. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to ask Representative Pearson why he didn't, instead of um, selecting only some of the retiree one of the retiree groups and not the both of them why didn't he just select both groups and use two percent because my my lack of confidence in the ability to to have this actually help the taxpayer is irrespective of a percentage it is a, it is the philosophy to which i have seen go forward for the last 20 years so within this within group especially the, the education wise so you know where where the education gets more attention in the state of new hampshire than anything else anything else to the point where we have towns that have saus offices that have larger budgets than their entire town government there is a line that needs to be drawn and frankly i've had enough i just have had enough follow up follow up please Representative Pierce, Son. with the, with the ex exception of 
the two largest cities in the state, it has always, absolutely always been the case that the schools cost more than the municipal side of the budget. That's, that's just how it is. There are far more employees of cities and towns that work for the school system. It's just what the job is. Representative Fellows, I don't mean the this, this schools as a whole. I'm sp specifically referring, referring to just the SAU office of some of these towns have massive budgets that, that are rivaling their own entire town budgets. So I, I, I get the fact that the schools are off. They're obviously your, typically your town's largest employer and certainly from an employee standpoint, dwarf any other of the town side of things combined. There's no question in that. It's just the, we, we've gotten to the point where just the administration of schools has become so grossly inflated that, and, and this isn't even translating down to the classrooms. So I'm just, I cannot, I cannot stomach just continuously throwing money in here without seeing some kind of results and some kind of restraint on the, on the part of these school boards where I'm um, looking at emergency services, doing everything they can, doing less than mo with more. That's exactly what I meant. <laughs> more with less. And, and, and really taking, taking the hits. And then when they save a nickel, the school's spending the dime. I, I'm drawing the line. I've just had it. And, and I think that those that are doing the right thing, that are really trying their best, deserve to have some sort of good faith on the state's part to, to, to acknowledge that and those that are not don't deserve it. And that's I'll that. up in one, just one more comment, please. Yes. Um, I, I am quite amazed that in a discussion about the state's obligation to support the retirement system, that this has devolved into a discussion of SAU budgets. That is really a huge step stretch in my imagination. Thank yep. you. A lot of money in SAU budgets. Representative Allegro. Well, I, I like this amendment and I think it's a good resolution to the impasse that we may have reached. And here's why. Notwithstanding the idea that we're all the same, we are dealing with separate entities here, right? We're dealing with the school districts versus the municipalities. In one case, you have uh, one group tightening their belt, and in the other uh, group, you have a continuation of profligate spending. And we're separate entities in another sense as well. I'm here representing my constituents from Camden, not from Mashua. So I have to go back to Camden, theoretically speaking, and explain to the constituents there, to the residents of Canton, why they're picking up the tab for the profligate spending in the uh, National School District. And so I think that this distinction allows us to bring relief to one entity that has been tightening their belt, as I understand it, uh, but uh, brings the reality of responsibility to the, to the other entity who has not. So I'll be supporting this amendment. Yeah, I mean, the reason to bring in uh, the SAU uh, spending and school spending is that, I mean, their spending and the number of employees uh, they hire has an influence on what the pension cost is and therefore what the state's going to have to pay for it. Yet, first of all, we don't have any direct control over that. And, uh, you know, we have, we're concerned that, that they're not being responsible in that regard. And therefore, uh, you know, I'm not comfortable, um, you know, putting us on the hook for further, in my view, uncontrolled and irresponsible spending. Thank you. Representative Schultz and Representative O'Brien, you've already spoken twice, so I'm gonna let people who haven't spoken speak before I call on you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question for Representative Pearson is, given that pensions are a promise, and given that that promise has been made as well to local cities and towns from the state, and given that that promise is, is also for you as a firefighter, isn't it perilous to forego the 
um, promises to the teachers too. Wouldn't you want to, as a firefighter, support all public employees' pensions that are equally a promise? Uh, Representative Schultz, you're getting very close to impugning his motives, and we don't allow that. And okay. I Let me see if I can rephrase it. Here's what I, I didn't mean to do that. I see what you're saying. Um, and I will say that this, this bill does not affect any benefits or pension results or contributions by any employee. All it affects is who is paying the state share. Please, please go. Fair enough. I, the concern I have, though, is when we start to parse this out and we start to pick apart what has been promised, it really does pit groups against each other that shouldn't be pit, pitted against each other is re really what I'm trying to say. Whether it's the promises we've made to public employees who are public servants who I feel are underpaid but these promises should be met, or the taxpayers uh, paying property taxes that are struggling. I hate to see any of our public services of what we offer to our communities also be thrown under the bus. And I, well, I oppose this amendment because of that. Um, I wish more time to debate, just Steve and I over lunch, but it is as it is. So, so to, to, to add a historical context here, because I did tell you that I am, um, I've really kind of taken it upon myself to be a, a student of this. It, if it really truly was about things rising and falling together, the pension changes in 2011 should have done that, and they did not. Group two took a much bigger punch in the face than group one did in the 2011 pension changes. So we've already gone down that road of looking at these two groups separately. And I, I'm not, I completely agree with your, with your statement in reference to public employees. It's no secret that I'm a big supporter of, of the employees themselves. My sister was a school teacher in New Hampshire and my, my brother's a corrections officer. So there's no, there's no love missing from my heart for these people. But this is, this is a deal that has to do with the, in, the administrations of, of these various entities and just a, just at some point taking a stand. And that's, and it's really just his, like I said before, historically, we're giving them a dime and they're spending a quarter. And it, that is just not sustainable. And I just don't have the faith that this would equate to tax relief. And I wish I did. Represent, yes. It's almost five. And I don't know if the question's appropriate, but. No. Okay. Debate in committee cannot be curtailed if you okay. can't move the question. Representative Fautnow. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I just wanted to, I, I'm, I kind of missed the whole connection here between uh, House Bill 274 and, and splitting the difference between the group one and group two. Um, you know, and not that I disagree at all. I've, I've been at many uh, city council meetings and, and hollered and, and whined about property taxes and where's all the money going and why are they spending it on this and that and etc. I don't disagree with the, with Representative Pearson on, on, on many of those issues. How, however, um, I don't think to, this doesn't this doesn't discern that at all whether you if you take group one out of this bill, it doesn't send less money to the uh, to the school department. it, it simply sends mon less money, from the state back to the municipality. It doesn't, it doesn't help the firefighters. It doesn't help the policemen. It doesn't hurt the teachers. It hurts the taxpayers, plain and simple. It's, it's all, it's just one, it's one some uh, group of money going to the municipality. And so I don't see, I, I think it would have made more sense if you, if you wanted to lower the amount of money to lower the percentage, but I don't, um, I don't understand this, uh, this separation in this particular bill. Thank you, Representative Goley. Goley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am gonna oppose the amendment. I think uh, we heard from the Municipal Association and many cities and towns across the state looking for 
relief and looking for a small fraction of the promises that were made by the state of New Hampshire uh, and covering parts of the costs of the cities and towns towards the uh, state retirement system. And taking one piece of that pie away, I cannot support. Um, it was group one and group two at the beginning, and it should go back to remaining group one and group two when the state gives their um, percentage uh, discount to the cities and towns. So I will vote against the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative O'Brien. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there's a couple of facts. Uh, and uh, if I just would like to share with the committee. Um, basically, as many of you know, uh, yeah, I was a firefighter for 35 years, and you know, I am currently a member of the New Hampshire Retirement System and receiving benefits. So let's get that out there. But I am also, besides the state rep, I am also vice president of the Board of Aldermen for the city of Nashua. I am on the budget committee and I am on the finance committee. And I think when we get together, we don't establish the tax rate. Actually, the state does establish the tax rate. But basically, when we work in, in the budget and come to find out, what we basically do is we try to run the city based upon the needs. Now, there was a statement that was made that I can't guarantee that some of these savings will go back. Well, where would they go is the question. Uh, at the theoretically, the way you run the city, at the end of the fiscal year, you are theory, in theory are not supposed to be sitting on millions and millions and millions of dollars. The city is not a bank. It's supposed to provide service to each community. So, yes. We do have a rainy day account, such as we had situations in the past where a school wall fell down and needed to be repaired and stuff. And yes, we did take that money out of our rainy day account. But basically, when the question gets asked, where does the money go? It goes in back into the community on many of the things. And one of the most important things, where will some of this money go by a positive vote? on 274 without this amendment in your communities. Because I asked you to talk to your city fathers and your leaders on this, and I hope that you did. But where would that money go? It would go back into your community. By not supporting this, you might be doing members of your community a disservice. You may be. Now, there was also another statement that uh, Oh, I don't know if I want to support Nashua with all this. Well, let me take you down the road of percentages. Nashua doesn't pay more or doesn't pay less than your community into the New Hampshire retirement system. It pays a percentage of basically what the employee does. So therefore to say one community gets a better deal than another community, I think that's a very fair question that the next time Mr. Collin comes up from NHRS that you can ask him. He'll tell you no. Uh, firefighters and police officers, like I say, pay within the 12 percentile and teachers pay within the 7 percentile. That's true all across the board in the whole state. Nobody is getting any special benefits. So to say within what does money do within the city budget? Maybe in your community, if you just please, like I say, is the power of the, the election box. Maybe you can influence the budget. But basically, what happens right now with this, this has the backing of the New Hampshire Municipal Association, as Representative Goley said. And the reason they support it, it is a car across the board attempt to alleviate the tax, the burden on the taxpayers. And that's why I wrote 274. And unfortunately, with deepest respect to Representative Pearson, it would partially dismantle that because by just with the volume of group two people alone, you would be taking down basically a half a percent or something like that, that would benefit the taxpayers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Allegro? No, I'm forced to respond to that. I don't uh, remember hearing anybody uh, say the things that you quoted being said there. 
Certainly I can speak for myself, I didn't say that. Uh, but I will say this, you're absolutely right. The city is not a bank. So there should, be not, there should not be millions and millions and millions of dollars in surplus. Neither should there be millions and millions and millions of dollars in debt. Now, I didn't say that one community gets more or benefits more from the other, but I'll tell you what I did say. I don't remember my exact words, but I'll use the same sentiment. Certainly some communities waste more. And going back to my community and telling them that they have to pay for the waste in communities that waste more than us. And mind you, mind you, my district, my town, my community wastes plenty of money. I mean, that's the problem. And that goes right to the heart of uh, Representative Pearson's assertion here is that if we reward waste by coming in constantly and giving a quarter for every, or get, you know, having a quarter request for every dime that we offer and then paying it, the waste never ends. And uh, I know I had one other thing to say, but uh, the hour is getting late and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to uh, speak, needs to speak? Okay, seeing none, the motion is to adopt amendment 0295 to House Bill 591, House Bill 274. And the clerk will call the roll. Representative Warner. Yes. Yes. Representative Pearson. Yes. Representative Yakubovich. Yes. Representative Lekas. Yes. Representative Allegro. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Rep Representative Lanzara. Yes. Representative Santa Nastasa. Yes. Representative Goley. No. Representative Schuett. No. Representative Judy. No. Representative Schmidt. No. Representative Schultz. No. Representative Fellows. No. Representative Funk. No. No. Representative Broder. No. Representative O'Brien. No. Chair. Yes. Amendment prevails ten nine. Representative Pearson, do you have a motion? I'll make a motion to vote on Second. Second. All right, that's okay. Vote by Representative Pearson. Seconded by Representative Allegro. All right. Do you wish to speak to your motion? I think we've done an excellent job as a committee in making this issue. And Allegro? Uh, no, I think it's all been encapsulated. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the motion of ought to pass with, with this amendment? Okay. Seeing none, in that case, the clerk will call the roll. Ought to pass this amended uh, representative Werner. Yes. Yes. Representative Pearson? Yes. Representative Yakubovich? No. Representative Lekas? No. Representative Allegro? I'm sorry, I'm, con I'm confused. We're voting on ought to pass the motion. Amended. Ought to pass the yes. amendment. Yes. Representative Bailey? Yes. Representative Lanzaro. Yes. Representative Santo Nastasso. No. Representative Goley. No. Representative Schuett. No. Representative Judy. No. 
Representative Schmidt? No. Representative Schultz? No. Uh, Representative Fellows? No. Representative Funk? No. Representative Broden? No. Representative O'Brien? No. Uh, and the chair? Yes. Seven in the affirmative, 12 in the negative. The motion fails. Let the pass amended fails. Can we move on to pass without amendment? No. May. Representative Schultz moves on to pass. Without amendment. Yes. On to pass purely without the amendment. I'll second. I really feel like he should be doing the first one. And he's no, um, no, no, I've ever heard that um, that motion before. This is ought to pass. Uh, Representative Schultz, you made the motion. Yes, she did. And the second was Representative O'Brien. Brian, yes, thank you. Is there anything to be said that wasn't already said? I don't think so. I think we've been pretty articulate today, huh? I agree, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. The motion is brought to pass on House Bill 274 by Representative Schultz. Representative Werner. No. Clerk, puts no. Representative Pearson. No. Representative Yakovovich. No. Representative Lekas. No. Representative Allegro. No. Representative Bailey. No. Representative Lanzara. No. Representative Santo Nastasso. No. Representative Goley. Yes. Representative Schuett. Yes. Representative Judy. E oui. Representative Schmidt. Yes. Rep <clears throat> Schultz. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Funtno. Yes. Representative Broda. Yes. Representative O'Brien. Yes. And the chair? No. Uh, nine ten. Uh, I move we retain this bill in committee. Is second. there a second? Second if I represent the Lake Rose. I'll third it if you like. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> obviously, obviously, we can't find something to ground. Well, well, ITL. Well, we we'll try that. Yeah. Right. So, what happens if the retained bill? And we can consider any other motion. Has this not been? Madam Has Chair, there not been a motion made? Yes, Representative Schmidt, the motion was made. Representative Boley? Okay. Do you want, I'll let you speak to your motion first, and then I'd like to speak on this motion. Okay. Um, we have not been able to agree on ITL, ought to pass, or ought to pass with an amendment. No one else has brought forward any other amendment. We're at our deadline, and this is something that we are divided on, but it is important, and I think we, we should retain it. Representative Bowling, please speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be voting against retaining. Uh, this isn't the only other option we have. We have the option of sending it to the floor without recommendation if this motion shall fail. Um, this is the budget year. This is when this should be being taken up. The cities and towns are looking for relief, and this is a way of providing that relief. This is scheduled to go to the second hearing uh, so that it would be, the numbers can be figured out and it can be part of, um, if passed, uh, can be included within the budget. If we retain it, it does no good. The budget will be done. The money won't be there. So I don't see a reason to retain this. I think we should vote on it, act on it today and 
Uh, if we have to send it to the floor without recommendation, I'll let the whole house vote on it. Thank you. Unless someone wants to step up, we can't send it without recommendation. Is that a, an odd number on the committee? Sorry. But uh, anyone else? Would, well, I would, I would also like to mention that the Senate has a similar bill that includes a contribution to retirement system. We are working on it, I believe. I don't know whether it has passed the Senate or not. I do know it is being considered there. Point of, point of order, Madam Chair. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Representative. Point of order. Please. I, I believe if no motion comes out of this committee with a positive vote, then it goes to the floor without recommendation, is my recollection. So if this goes down and we've made all of the attempts on the motions and nothing passes, that is when it goes to the floor. It doesn't go on a tie vote. It goes on a... Thank you. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of it. Thank you. Arling, is that the case? Can we vote to give it with no recommendation? Yes, if, if every motion fails, you're you're left with no recommendation. Okay. In that case, I will withdraw my motion to retain and entertain Representative Foley's motion to send it with no recommendation. I second. Actually, vote on that, or just do nothing. No, the, <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. If I may, um, and Pam, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I'm not even sure if retain has to be taken up as long as we take up the ITL, the amendments, and the ought to pass to send it on without recommendation. And Pam, could you correct me if I'm wrong? No, I could. I could give Paul Smith a call if you like to be to be 100 sure. I'm not sure about that. Well, we definitely ought not to hypothesize. Let's right. find out from the clerk. I've got his uh, cell phone. I'll, I'll be back to you. Okay. Well, we, it won't hurt to vote on no recommendation. There, Madam um, Chair, if I may, there is no vote on, a, on that motion. It's just right. if all the other votes <laughs> fail, then that's the way the committee sends it. There is no way to vote. You cannot send something by a positive vote. Correct. Is that being the motion? Okay. Now, if I if I'm clear on that, <laughs> I would agree with Representative Goley. I believe the clerk is going to state that uh, without recommendation is technically not a motion that we would vote on. Oh. Yeah, that's how it was with Indigenous Peoples Day about a year or two ago. Our motions weren't working then either. The difference is that it was not. Yeah. Madam Chair, while we're waiting, I just want to commend you for taking us through this, this very complicated and, um, let's see how I can use a, 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 a topic that has great difference of opinion. And I, I feel as if I've certainly been heard, and I just want you to know that I appreciate um, the work and your sentiment during this bill. The voting of this bill. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, please. While we're waiting, I just want to say uh, how much uh, that I did enjoy the, the debate on this particular bill. I thank you for listening to me, being a new member of the committee. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we have all our opinions, and of course, I respect that. But I, I did enjoy, and I thought it was a uh, a very well thought of discussion on both sides of the issue on it. And I thank you all for that. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for a legal debate. Um, committee, and uh, I'm glad I'm having this uh, good experience. I've heard uh, what's happened on some other committees uh, which have not been the same. And I really appreciate it. Um, Assuming that we, we agree on no recommendation, Representative O'Brien, would you care to write the recommendation of what to pass? Thank you, Madam Chair, I would. All right, I will write a recommendation in favor of an expedient to legislate and mention the amendment that was adopted but not, uh, not included with it. Uh, when does it uh, need it? I'm kind of working on my first novel. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no,
I assume this can't be a novel. Uh, if it needs to be a novel, it can be a novel. <laughs> I would I would say that a short story is probably the maximum most yes. people. No, no, excuse me, Madam Chair. I meant, what, what is the date that you would like it by? Monday. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it, it will be novel, though. Hey, Madam Chair, once you write those in the casting, <laughs> if you write yeah. that, that's right. That's too much like the novel coronavirus. Yeah. Let's uh, not go there. Sp Representative Cytek, please. Speaking of novels, I'm thinking of uh, Moby Dick, where he should have left well enough alone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to, here is some heresy for another day. I like the property tax. <laughs> and I will, I like to defend that position sometime. I'm with you. Yeah. I've also heard you say you like the sales tax, too. If, that, if it comes to it. Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I tried calling the House Clerk on his cell phone and got his voicemail, so I did not have success there. But well, I, I go with Representative Goley's experience as a former chair sure. and, and say we will put it out with no recommendation and have argue, arguments in favor of the law to pass. And we'll it's gonna come out it sounds reasonable oh. to me for what it's worth. <laughs> no, if none of the motions passed. Delightful day in the, in the neighborhood. neighborhood. What did you say? What did you say? So, are we meeting next Thursday? Is that correct? Yes, we are Monday. meeting. Monday is a holiday and a day off for everyone who has their blurbs in. Mm -hmm. uh, two, we are meeting on Thursday for the continued hearings for these bills, for the morning bills. And we are then meeting the following Monday on the last of our original, uh, most of the, all the special days and a few other bills. And are we starting at 9.30 or 10 on the 18th? 10. Okay. Thank you. Right. And thank you all again. We are adjourned. Thank you. And I'll buy the first round. There you go. God bless you. <laughs> Have a safe ride home, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, waiting for Pam to shut the recording. I have to go downstairs and uh, enjoy my life. Amazingly, education on HB20, get out early. Get out of here. Who, a lot of people who sign up to talk never shut up. Uh, second day. Sam, the uh, I assume the video and the and the audio are off now. No, they're not. Sorry. Please, somebody turn off the video. I can exactly turn off. I can turn both off.